After the soul-crushing failures of ExoZombies and Infinite Warfare, I was 100% convinced that no non-Treyarch studio could do zombies properly, and that this game was going to be terrible. Was I right? Well, let's get into it, shall we? I really like World War II zombies. I honestly didn't expect to be saying this, but I love the atmosphere, I love the new additions to the zombies formula, I love the story, I love the characters. Well, two of them are pretty good. Like I said at the top of the video, I was 100% convinced that only Treyarch could do zombies properly, and I'm more than happy to admit that I was wrong. Sledgehammer seems to have taken the criticism of Exo Zombies and the newer entries to heart, and created something that feels like a return to zombies' roots, but something new at the same time. The more recent maps were too hard for newer players to get into? Well, here's an optional notebook guide that shows you your objectives and your items of importance. The games have strayed too far from their horror roots? Well, here's a map filled with dark hallways and genuinely disturbing creatures. The new games don't feel grounded anymore? Well, you get the idea. But we're not here to mindlessly foam at the mouth like, Oh my god, this game is so good. Or, Oh my god, this game is literally worse than actual war. Too. We're here to instead take a more critical look at everything the package has to offer. Well, I've rambled enough, let's dive right into World War II Zombies. Like with the Infinite Warfare review, I feel it'd be best to start with the elements that carry through the entire game, and then move on to the maps themselves. Starting with the gameplay and the things I like about it. World War II, in true Sledgehammer format, wasn't fit with simply applying a new coat of paint and calling it a day like some other zombies experiences that shall remain nameless because god forbid I criticize something you like. Instead, they take what worked about the best entries and build upon it by adding completely new gameplay mechanics and it actually works out this time. Starting with the class loadouts. Much like Extinction, the pre-game loadouts allow you to further tailor the game to your playstyle beyond just picking from the map's available perks. Say for instance that you like to serve as a cautious medic of your party. Then you can pick certain abilities to accentuate that playstyle such as camouflage and preventative medicine. Or let's say you prefer a more brutish, run and gun approach to zombies. There's mods and specials for you too like Shell Shock and Free Fire. You can also customize and change the starting weapon before each match. You start out with only a pistol, but eventually, through leveling your character up, you can take a double barrel shotgun or even a semi-automatic rifle in place of it. But with this loadout system comes one thing I don't like, the consumables. They're so rarely obtained because of the terrible earn rate for zombie crates, and they barely even affect gameplay. This system isn't necessarily a step down from the admitted improvement Infinity Ward made with their Fate and Fortune cards, but rather, it just feels like an afterthought that only exists because A, well the other guys did it, so we kinda have to, and B, because microtransaction. Another thing I actually really like is the armor and self-revive system. In every zombie's experience since Black Ops 2, three of your four perk slots were pretty much spoken for every game. You need Quick Revive if you want to keep your game going, you need Juggernaug to deal with the faster zombies, and in some games' cases, unforgivably terrible zombie collision. And of course, Double Tap makes your weapons more powerful, so of course you need it. So now you only have one free perk slot. Or in IW's case, you have two. World War II does away with that. Kind of. Double Tap is still mandatory, but due to the presence of armor and self-revive, provided you have some remaining, it's the only perk that's pretty much essential, giving you more potential variety in your perk loadouts. And adding on to that is the fact that Mule Kick and PhD are now mods, so that's even more freedom for you. And while we're talking about perks, it's a relatively minor thing, or maybe it's not, depends on your point of view. But I hate the perk buying animation in this game. Sure, it looks cool and makes sense canonically, but let's ignore canon for just a second and look at it from a gameplay stance. You know something's bad when I'm saying, ignore the story implications. It's very difficult to buy perks mid-round and solo since you're immobilized for two seconds and unable to fight back for another three. Bad kid, bad kid, there's a bad kid right there. If I do say so myself, I say so. That's what I'm not talking about right there, right there, right there. Ooh, bad shit. Oh, one last thing I forgot to mention. The zombie collision is fucking fantastic. You never get caught on stray zombies like in World of War, and with the right timing, you're able to easily maneuver yourself out of tight situations. Well, of course the zombie collision is good, Rizzo. It's been good since World of War. No developer could possibly fuck up that badly. Right? Okay, back on track. The Notebook Hint System. The Notebook is a new feature to Call of Duty Zombies that attempts to bridge the gap between the hardcore only nature of Black Ops 3's more difficult maps and the more casual nature of Black Ops 1 and Infinite Warfare. When active, it'll show you your current objective and outline certain important items essential to completing said objective. 
However, this will only get you so far. The notebook only assists you through the casual path, which consists of getting the power on, building the base Tesla gun, and completing the casual version of the map's main quest. But fear not, hardcore audience. There's still plenty of hidden little Easter eggs sprinkled through the map, and there's an extended ending just for you. The notebook can also be used to give you insight on certain items and weapons around the map, which, speaking of little things, the quality of life things. These are just the little details that don't necessarily change the game dramatically, but instead just make the experience feel better overall. I'm going to list these off real quick. Power up spawn behind zombies so you don't accidentally pick them up during a round transition. The shotgun point system returns some exo zombies, so you earn points for every pellet hit instead of on a per shot basis. Points can be instantly shared at any time with the press of a button, instead of having to go to a certain spot on the map or using the hacker for 18 years. Traps don't deal enormous amounts of damage to the player instantly, so they're more forgiving of slip ups and, thank god, griefing opportunities are cut down on. You're given 20 seconds between rounds, and there's a countdown telling you how much time is left. The game has a text pop-up telling you when the Panzer Mortar is stunned and when he's not, so you don't have to guess every time. Max Amos refill your clip when grabbed. Important quotes now have subtitles, so you'll never miss anything. Most quest-related quotes have multiple takes, so that if you're in a tight situation, your character will shout it instead of calmly saying it like in previous entries. You can select your character in the pregame lobby, which is something I've wanted for years. I always loved playing specifically as Richthofen in Black Ops 3, but some days the game just wouldn't let me have him. But now with this, I can play as my favorite character every game if I want to. It's always Marie. And finally, the special prompt stays up on screen until used. This may annoy some players, but I personally really love this because I'm admittedly kind of a klutz and would always forget that I even had my special weapons in Black Ops 3. With this, I never forget. Now that we're through what I liked about the gameplay, let's get into the story. There, I put gameplay before story. Are you happy, comment? The story of World War II Zombies reminds me much of Extinction in that it's simple, yet expansive, easy to follow, yet rewards a more inquisitive viewer. The real story begins with Dr. Marie Fisher's journal entries. Wait, journal entries? I didn't see those in-game. Well, that's because they're not. The journal entries were part of the minuscule marketing for zombies this year, and as such, you have to go online to view them. The journals provide some backstory on Marie's time in the OSS, her contentious relationship with her brother Klaus, their father's death, his defection from the Nazi party, and ultimately, her assembly of a team that can help her get back home in time to rescue him. None of this is mandatory reading, as the prologue does its job of introducing us to the team and world, but it does help flesh out the story and the Fisher family. The point I'm trying to make is, a casual viewer will still be able to understand what's going on, and if that grabs them, then they can go look up the extra stuff online instead of having to read, um, this mess. Look, I love Treyarch's new zombie story. I think it's fantastic, and there's nothing really like it. But even I have to admit, it's extremely alienating to casual viewers. The journals lead us directly into the prologue, where our heroes, and this one guy that has four lines of dialogue, are getting debriefed on their mission to Middleburg. Their mission is to recover the ancient relic Straub and Co. been experimenting with, while Marie's is primarily to rescue her brother. At this point, we get a brief glimpse at a giant monster that flips our train car and separates Marie from the rest of the squad, setting our main story in motion. One last thing I'd like to mention before we get into the characters is that this game's story makes an attempt to canonize or rationalize everything in some way. Points, wall buys, doors, etc. now offer an in-universe explanation. Points are now jolts and are stored in the battery on your person. Every time a zombie is killed, their energy is absorbed into the battery, which can be used to unlock weapon caches, generate power for the mystery box, and open doors fitted with special locks. I don't pretend to understand the science. Now we move on to the characters. World War II Zombies' on-disc experiences feature an all-star cast of Doctor Who's David Tennant, Daredevil's Elodie Young, Pulp Fiction's Ving Rhames, Baron Frankenstein himself, Udo Kier, and Catherine Winnick. What was she in? Okay, a bunch of stuff I haven't seen. Let's start things off with the good. This applies to all characters, but they're much more serious this time around and rarely crack jokes. I know some people prefer the jokier characters found in Treyarch's early entries, and while I enjoy them too, I understand that Sledgehammer were going for something completely different here. Did that sound condescending to the people who like the jokier characters? Maybe, but I really didn't mean for it to. My bad. Sledgehammer said that they wanted to go for something a bit more grounded and less fantastical with Nazi zombies. So naturally, in a real world zombie scenario, god forbid, there might be one goofball cracking a joke or two, the role which Drosten fills. But everyone else would be much more focused on survival than, as Takio would put it, No time for clever quips. We have a war to win. Whether you like this or not comes down to personal preference. But after the absolute train wrecks that were the Victus crew in Black Ops 2 and every character in Infinite Warfare Zombies, except for God himself, of course. I'm totally cool with something a bit more grounded. Let's start out with our main character, Marie Fisher. 
Much like Black Ops 3's Richthofen or Mob of the Dead's Arlington, Marie is clearly the focal character of our group and as a result, is easily the most developed. We understand why she's doing what she's doing, we get a sense of her moral code through the journal entries and her fights with Klaus, we get the tenacity for which she fights for him through quotes I've never heard in game, but instead heard through extracting them, and after failing to save him from the Panzer Mortar, we see that she's the one with the most humanity. As for Klaus, we understand why he decided to side with the Nazi party 10 years ago. He was an idealist, blinded by his patriotism and his need to have a purpose in life. But as the Nazi's occupation of Middleburg drew on, and Straub's creations became more and more twisted, he called out to Marie for help and set in motion a plan to help her get to him and stop Straub once and for all. He's the one who hid the parts for the Tesla guns, started the outbreak, and hid the symbols in the paintings needed to activate the voice of God. These revelations give us a clear understanding of his moral compass, as well as finally giving us an in-universe explanation as to why all these cool and powerful things are just conveniently laying around the map. Marie and Klaus are just all-around solid characters, but talking about the good of these characters does lead me into two problems I have. Number one, the other three characters, Drosten Hind, Olivia Durant, and Jefferson Potts. My name is Jeff. While they're serviceable, have their own quirks, and are entertaining in their own right, it's clear that the focus was on the Fisher family, and as a result, everyone else feels a bit underdeveloped. They all have their moments of humanity, but they're mainly just them comforting Marie along the journey. And some of the stuff we know about them isn't even communicated to us in-game. Like, I know that Olivia's parents were taken by the Nazis, and that's why she does what she does. But that's only because Elodie Young si Elodie? I might be pronouncing that right. Said it herself during the Zombies Comic Con panel. And yes, yeah, she was uh, very keen on joining the team because her dad um, got captured by the Nazis. And she's very passionate about art and, um, and so, yeah, so. And number two, Elodie Young's accent in the intro. I have no idea what she's trying to do here. The Nazis have taken so much from us all. This art belongs to the people. Okay, but seriously, this little goofy aside does bring up a valid point. The deliveries are, for the most part, solid, but there are a few standouts where you just wish they had tried the line one more time. For example, I'm sorry, Marie. We'll find them. I promise. However, these problems I have are things that could easily be corrected in the future, just like Exozombies and Black Ops 3. In Exozombies, the characters were all okay-ish, and you got them as people kind of. But as the season went on, they were further developed and the actors got more comfortable in their roles. Similar story for Black Ops 3. The only one of our main four heroes who was really well developed was Richthofen. But again, as the season progressed, each character was built on until the ending of Revelations, where they all came together as completely changed people with new beliefs. Now, this is all assuming we even see these characters again. The cynical side of me is saying, these are all established actors, they won't be able to afford them for the whole season. But the hopeful part of me is thinking, well, Sledgehammer clearly has a massive budget for zombies. I mean, just look at their cutscenes. These can't be cheap. And there was this line that makes me think, okay, they're totally setting up for a season-long journey with these four. Or at least Marie. How you can prepare yourself for a journey. I genuinely haven't been this anxious about whether or not a cast was coming back since After Origins. And with the characters done, that wraps up the overarching elements, which means it's finally time to get into the maps themselves. Starting with the prologue and Grosten House. I think I pronounced that right. A first for Call of Duty co-op modes, the prologue serves as a tutorial mode of sorts where players new and old can get accustomed to the mechanics of the game mode, including the cheap jump scares. Oh, we're doing this? Great! Once you arrive at the farmhouse, the rounds can progress and you can leave at any time, provided you have the 2500 points needed to escape. Here's where things get a little more interesting. See, the game will tell you that you have enough to escape, but there's nothing preventing you from surviving in the house for as long as you can. There's even special hidden challenges associated with the prologue for the really hardcore players that unlock special bonus characters for use in Grosten House and the Final Reich. One of these challenges is survive until wave 25 in the prologue. And, uh... I have no idea how you people do this. After escaping the farmhouse, the game will end as Marie heads towards Middleburg with hopes of regrouping with her team, leading us directly into the events of the Final Reich. But before we move on to the Final Reich, let's quickly go over the survival variant of the prologue, Grosten House. Grosten House serves as the game's secondary, non-objective oriented survival map in the lieu of Black Ops 2's Nuketown Zombies and Black Ops 3's The Giant. Except for the fact you don't have to buy a $60 season pass for this. Grosten House is literally just the farmhouse from the prologue. Except for in this variation, the farmhouse has a recharging Wonderfizz-esque machine, a mystery box, and a small little easter egg that pack-a-punches all weapons in the box. To do this, get a Jeff in the box, 
Jeff in the box. What the fuck ever. Throw it on this beam, save 10,000 points, give it to this piano, and voila, pack a punch weapons for all. The only problem I have with this map, besides its lack of content, is the inclusion of whistlings. With how small the map is, this was a terrible idea, especially spawning in multiple whistlings at once. They're fine in the final Reich, spoilers, but with the play space this cramped, their inclusion borderline ruins the experience. So overall, there's not much to talk about with Grosten House. I personally don't find it all that interesting, as I like some meat on the bones of my zombies experiences. But if you're in the mood for some old school, Nocturne-Toten-esque zombies action, I'd recommend giving it a shot. And even I can't deny that when I'm not in the mood for an hour-long commitment, Grosten House serves as a reasonably amusing diversion. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the final Reich. The Final Reich serves as the game's main on-disc experience and, as is the case since Black Ops 2, offers a ton of content for every type of player. Let's start, as we normally do, with the things the map does right. And spoilers, we're gonna be here a while. The map design. Easily the most important part of any map. Trumping story, characters, easter eggs, or even the main features. And the Final Reich absolutely nails it in this category, giving us the most natural flowing zombies experience since Black Ops 3's Der Eisendrock. Like Der Eisendrock, and to a much lesser extent, zombies in Spaceland and Shadows of Evil, the Final Reich features many different sized areas, ranging from tight close quarters to wide open areas to train zombies around. There's also tubes around the map that allow you to fast travel to the Pack-a-Punch area, which serves as the map's hub area and that it allows you to access every main area of the map with ease. The village, bunker, and docks all have paths that lead here, so if you want to save some time trekking around, just find your nearest pipe and head down to the pack area. While we're on the topic of pack-a-punch, the unlock method is, thankfully, quite simple. It uses the zombies gold standard of run around the entire map and activate a few things, found in Darius and zombies in Spaceland with their teleporters, Ascension's Lunar Landers, their Eisendrock's pack-a-punch assembly, and Revelations' corruption engines, just to name a few. I also really love the fact that you can buy ammo for any standard weapon after upgrading it. Much like Unlimited Sprint, I always thought that this kind of addition would just break the balance of zombies. But again, I was wrong. Cleverly, Sledgehammer have one balancing factor in place that prevents the system from being flat out broken. And that's that you can only purchase ammo for standard weapons, whereas special weapons like the Tesla guns can only be refilled with max ammo drops. This system helps make the game, well at least the first 30 rounds or so, feel more about personal skill and concentration rather than Oh well, I ran out of ammo, let's grab a wall weapon and expend clip after clip until I get an ammo drop. It's also just a ton of fun to use your personal favorite weapon. Let's say you get that full auto rocket launcher that I can't remember the name of, and you just want to go to town with Flak Jacket. Well, you can do that now. And you can do it for more than 5 seconds. Personally, I'd love to see this system adopted by the other studios, but something tells me that this game is the last time we'll see this edition. The environment and atmosphere. Jesus, goddamn Christ, the atmosphere of this map is wonderful. Due to the somewhat linear nature of the early game setup, the map is able to build up a sense of growing dread more effectively than something more free roamy like Transit, for example. It starts out normal enough, a quaint, snowy town, yet you can't quite shake the feeling that something's wrong you know, besides the undead. But as you progress through the map, things quickly take a turn for the worse, starting with the pest in the well. Unless you progress very slowly, this should be your first introduction to this enemy type, and it takes you by surprise more so than, oh, I guess it's time for a special zombie round. Oh, these are the special ones? Okay. Then you progress into the bunker, and the dread really starts to set in as you start encountering remnants of Dr. Straub's twisted works and the occasional scripted whistling breakout. It's all incredibly deliberate, yet it works very well. But the best part by far is the Tesla gun build process. You charge up the glorified soul box and then boom, all the lights go off in the facility and your only source of light is this low draw distance flashlight on your person. And to top it all off, just like the pests, if you do this process at just the right time, you'll get your first introduction to the Brenner, as he's scripted to sometimes spawn in as you're taking the pieces back to the workbench. Ah, Jesus! Who is this? Why is he yelling at us? Who is he? He's scaring everyone! The special weapons. Much like Zombies in Spaceland, this map has a ton of special weapons to play around with, starting with the Tesla gun and its accompanying upgrades. While the base Tesla gun may not be all that powerful, at least it's very easy to get. Simply lead the Geitzcraft device to three separate areas around the facility, and it'll be yours. This process is so simple, it can be done by round 6, which just so happens to be one of the hidden challenges for the special characters. 
Best part is, there's no RNG involved in the build process like the Apothecon Servant on Shadows of Evil, the KT4 on Zetsubo no Shima, or the Zapper that needs green coins in Spaceland. And then there's the upgrade quests. The Final Reich takes a page out of Origins and Derizendrak's book in this aspect and features four main Wonder Weapon upgrade quests so that everyone in your party can have their own special weapon. And thankfully, the upgrade quests are fairly straightforward. Well, at least three of them are. Shooting the 84 glowing lamps for the Bloodthirst is pretty damn annoying. Moving on to the side weapons, we have the Red Talon and the Classic. Functionally speaking, the Red Talon is pretty much just an upgraded shovel, but this one's got occasionally appearing evil bullshit magic that'll protect you during executions. Which, uh, that execution by the way. This will never get old for me. And last but certainly not least, my personal favorite, the Classic. On first glance, it just looks like a normal PPSH with a drum mag, but this variant of the PPSH is actually an homage to the Ward at War iteration. It's even got a similar fire rate and ammo capacity, and it gets a silver camo when pack-a-punch just like it did in Ward at War. This thing is purely unadulterated fan service, but I can't deny the massive smile it put on my face. It really is the little things, you know? The enemy balance. This was the thing that scared me the most before release, because, uh, well, Sledgehammer doesn't exactly have a good track record when it comes to these. And neither does Infinity Ward. Or even Treyarch. But to my surprise, every special enemy in the game serves a specific purpose and has an effective counter. They're not perfect though, but we'll get into that later. There's the Pest, which essentially serve as this map's Hellhounds. Low health, fast moving enemies that make you take them into consideration when planning your next move. Then there's the unintentionally hilarious Bombers, proximity activated mobile bombs. I have to go mobile. Their weakness is the little guy on their back constantly smacking his head on the bomb. All you have to do is shoot that and it'll die, disarming the bomber. However, this does send the bomber into a frenzy and it'll move faster than a standard zombie. So be sure to take it out quickly. And finally, there's the bigger enemies, the whistlings and the biggest bat of them all, the Brenner. The Whistlings can spawn mid-round and will move incredibly slowly until enraged. These are the most controversial addition to the map by far, but personally, I think they're one of the easiest to deal with if you know how to beat them. The weak point is their spine, so in co-op, it's as simple as having one teammate enrage it and then laying into it as it targets them. But solo is where things get a bit more tricky. Because they can spawn in numbers exceeding five at a time, which is a bit ridiculous, they may seem overpowered and broken. But in actuality, there are quite a few incredibly easy ways to take them down. The first and safest is to take them to either the pilot light trap in the square, or the electric trap down in the labs. The second is to acquire the base Tesla gun, shoot them, and while they're stunned, lay into the spinal cord. One more tip I have, if there's one blocking a doorway, shoot it. This may sound counterintuitive as shooting it will enrage it, but during his charge up animation, he cannot hurt you. So again, with the proper timing, you can slip right past him as he's gearing up for a charge. With this tactic though, remember, do not stop moving until you hear this clunk sound. This sound means that the whistling has hit a wall or has just simply stopped. If you haven't heard it, it's safe to assume it's still charging. And just like that, I've become a tips and tricks channel. Great. As for the Brenner, he's just a big hulking motherfucker with it sounds weird when I say motherfucker, I never really realized that. Let's go with something a little bit more PG-13. As for the Brenner, he's just a big hulking dude with a flamethrower with no specific counter besides destroying his fuel tanks. Once that's done, his flamethrower will be disabled, he'll catch on fire, and eventually die on his own. But be warned, his health scales exponentially with every arrival. Luckily, he only spawns every couple rounds, so he's not too big an issue. And only one can spawn at a time on solo, unless you get really unlucky when you're trying to build the Tesla gun, as seen here. And now we move on to the final enemy, question mark, the treasure zombie. If you're familiar with the treasure drones from Exo Zombies, you probably know what a treasure zombie does. But for those unfamiliar, a treasure zombie will walk around the map dropping points, and if you can kill it before it explodes, then you'll get a free power up. Only problems are, they're as rare as they are strong. Like, these things are bigger bullet sponges than a pre-patched brute. The casual quest. I really like when I can say this, as I don't feel I do it enough, but I like this map's quest. The casual one, not, not the hardcore one. Also, don't misinterpret that as this is the best zombies quest ever born. It's not overly simple like Raves or an absolutely indefensible mess like Revelations, Garrod Crovey, and Ah, uh, the Doot Doot Titty Thick, but instead it plays out like a Zombie Quest Greatest Hits album. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a standard defense slash soul collecting step like in Moon. There's a step where you need to run around the map and activate things in a certain amount of time, like Derizendrak. Hidden things that can only be revealed with a special weapon like Setsubo no Shima, an IGC prelude to the boss fight like Garrod Krovi, and a CGI outro that doesn't end the game like... No, wait, this is actually new. But talking about the main quest itself, I think it's a perfect time to get into the Panzer Mortar. <laughs> Thank you.
Now this is how you design a monster. From the carved out torsos that serve as its mouth, to the fact that Klaus is stuck inside it suspended by chains, this thing is horrific in every way, shape, and form, and I love it. Looking back, with this IGC in mind, it's kinda messed up that Klaus was right there in the prologue and Marie didn't even know it. Speaking of Marie, one last thing I'd like to mention before we get into the few things I take issue with. This shot in the outro. Five years later and I still can't write segues. Awesome. The reason I personally find this shot so striking is because we've never actually seen a character cry in COD Zombies before. Sure, we've heard some rando crying in Die Rise's radios, but this is the first time we've actually seen it. Even Black Ops 3, for all its talk of mortality and having to watch yourself check out, never fully went for it. It may not seem like much, but with the context of Marie and Klaus's contentious relationship, to see that shot of genuine anguish adds a human factor to the experience. But it doesn't end there. At first for Call of Duty Zombies, there's actually an extended ending if you do the hardcore version of the quest. Or as I like to call it, everything sucked for Marie Fisher, Director's Cut. Let's talk about that real quick. In the standard non-canon ending, she plays a part in the death of her brother, which is horrific enough on its own, but in the extended canon ending, she accidentally revives him with the hilt of Barbarossa's sword, which should be cause for celebration, but instead, Klaus berates her for her actions and starts stumbling away as Murray begs for him not to leave her. Then he starts screaming about how his blood is boiling, voices in the dark, and opening the gates of hell, and to top it all off, commits suicide via the pilot light in the square. God, even Black Ops 3 didn't cyberbully their characters this much. See, this is what I disliked most about the first two Black Ops Zombies games and Infinite Warfare. Keep in mind I'm speaking specifically about the Zombies portion of IW. That game's campaign was masterfully done when it came to characters. Villains? Eh, not so much. While I had some fun with them and they were admittedly charming in their own way, there was no humanity to those experiences so they just kind of faded from my memory. Well, they tried to, but I don't think I'll ever forget how fucking terrible these two were. Despite loving much about this map, I'd be remiss in not mentioning the few things it does wrong. Don't worry, this will be quick. The jump scares. With the first couple of runs, they help strengthen the mood, but after a while they feel cheap and annoying. Especially when you're just trying to get a quest step done and zombies keep popping out at you left and right. Hell, on rare occasion, a zombie's collision can block a choke point and trip you up. A Brenner can spawn during the Panzer Mortar boss fight. There's absolutely no way for me to justify this. It's just fucking nonsense. Especially if you're doing the fight later on in your match and the Brenner has a shit zillion health the bomber's proximity fuse. I can't get a beat on this thing. Sometimes you can stun it with gunfire and slip right on by untouched, but sometimes it'll just blow up and you'll take a hit. It feels a bit too RNG-ish for my liking. The Zeppelin step. On its own, I have no problem with this step. Damage the Zeppelin and charge up the battery it drops. Simple enough, right? But what I do have a problem with is the fact that you have to do this seven goddamn times throughout the quest. As much as I don't really like it, it's not too big a deal, as quests don't factor that much into my grading of a map, but I feel I wouldn't be doing my job properly if I just let this annoyance slip by. And finally, the pack-a-punch animation. Like the jump scares, it's cool the first couple of times, but after a couple of runs, it gets annoying. The animation itself is really long, and even when it looks like it's done, you'll actually have to wait another two seconds until the camo is applied, and then you can pick up your weapon. But until then, you're just sitting there like, Some BBQ, why can't I pick up Rocket's Arbiter? Oh my god. I don't know, man, but the most important thing to remember is not to panic. Be cool, cheat. Just be cool. Deep breaths. Dumbass. So, overall, the Final Reich is a surprisingly deep experience that offers tons of content while at the same time streamlining the experience for newer players and sets a very high bar. Not just for the non treyarch Zombies entries, but for Call of Duty Zombie mode in general. But perhaps even more surprising is that this map breaks tradition and proves that the other developers can do zombies properly. Which, for someone like myself who really didn't think they could, that's great. I don't care where the zombies comes from, if it's from Infinity Ward, Sledgehammer, Raven, Treyarch, as long as it's good, I'm happy. And in my opinion, this one is. So, overall, World War II Zombies is a fantastic, if slightly flawed rebound from the past two non-Treyarch Zombies entries that actually takes some risk by changing up the gameplay formula, while at the same time understanding what made the best Zombies entries work so well. The game controls well, the main map layout is great, the story is engaging, simple to follow, and actually makes you feel for two of the five main characters. I'm aware those aren't exactly fantastic numbers, but when you compare it to Black Ops 1, Black Ops 2, and Infinite Warfare Zombies, it's an effort I feel should be commended. Oh god, no, I'm feeling something! I need to... I need to go lay down. And finally, the prologue and the new notebook system makes the game more accessible to newcomers. That's a good thing, by the way. It's not dumbing down zombies for noobs. 
you know exactly who you are. Although I have to say, I do have some worries about the future. The special enemy balance has the potential to get catastrophic like exozombies and the tragedy from beyond. And while I genuinely like her, I really hope the DLC season isn't just the Marie Fisher story with some other forgettable clowns thrown in. Give the other characters some love like Black Ops 3 did. Again, that's even if these characters come back in the first place, but regardless, if they can crush those worries while keeping what worked about the base game content, I feel we're going to be in for a genuinely fantastic season of zombies. Well, that's all for today. What do you think of World War II zombies so far? Do you like it? Dislike it? Or do you just find yourself saying, eh, it's zombies again, whatever. Tell me what you think down below. And please, for the love of God, keep it civil this time. We don't need a repeat of the Infinite Warfare comment section, do we? Anyway, thanks for watching, and have a great day. I'm a fan of The Darkest Shore, which is super relieving because as much as I like the base game content, I recognize there are ways this could potentially go very wrong. Now I know what you're thinking. Weren't you done with YouTube, Rizzo? Well, I'll talk about that at the end, but for now, we've got a map to discuss. Before we dive into the depths of The Darkest Shore, I'd like to do a quick recap on what's changed since the release of World War II Zombies. If you'd just like to skip to my thoughts on the map itself, go to the timestamp on screen or you can check the description for all sorts of timestamps. Since launch, we've received some balancing updates to the game's meta in the form of mod and special readjustments. Camouflage now depletes faster when firing weapons, thus strengthening its role as a defensive ability instead of one of offense and defense. There was a nerf to fully loaded, but a global overall ammo buff to make it less of a crutch mod, and Grenadier no longer doubles your jack-in-the-boxes. Personally, I feel that all these changes are for the better. With a game like this, it's important to have a healthy and varied meta, lest the game get boring, or worse, frustrating. Just look at what happened to the war meta when Saboteur was introduced. Is this hell? There's also been new mods. Just before the release of DLC 1, we got 8 new mods, I'm not too certain on the exact number, but from what I've tested, they're all well balanced and don't disrupt the meta. Although I will say Sustained Zone is really top tier. Recently, we got a massive change to the health regen timers. Previously, to heal from 0 to 100 health, it took 11 seconds, which with the pace of the game, many players found to be problematic but now it only takes seven seconds for a full recovery. This is much more manageable, and it's a change I didn't even really know I wanted. All right, and weapons. We've also seen eight new weapons added to the box's rotation, and a couple of them are even starting weapons now. And last but certainly not least, bug fixes. I didn't talk much about bugs in my previous video because frankly, I didn't encounter many besides the supply drop glitch, which has since been fixed. Thank Christ. Along with the Red Talon XP exploit, progression issues, numerous out of map spots, treasure zombie duplication, the list goes on. What I'm trying to get across here is that the game is in a much better state than it was at launch. And with contracts and orders just on the horizon, I feel like that it's only going to get better. It helps that all this is free too. I like free stuff. I am a millennial after all. Now that we covered that, I'd say it's finally time to get into The Darkest Shore. Per the norm, we're going to start with the things I liked, the map design and its general flow. A lot of people won't believe me when I say this, since I value story and character a lot, but the thing I find most important in the Zombies map is its map layout and flow. Okay, let's go on a little tangent, bear with me. This is something that Zombies has struggled with quite often. Transit, Die Rise, and Shaolin Shuffle are some of the worst offenders. And I know what you're thinking. That's it? I thought you criticized Exozombies for the exact same thing. Well, yes, but Exozombies is much different. All four maps, in theory, are well designed, but solid design alone isn't enough. You need to take the map's gameplay elements into account as well. This is where Exozombies and the Beasts from Beyond especially messed up. Exozombies featured largely cramped CQC maps and the most aggressive zombies we've seen to date. And the Beasts from Beyond is just a balanced nightmare in every regard. There's too many gameplay elements working against each other. In exozombies, every zombie is incredibly fast, and most have special abilities that you need to account for. Problem was, these abilities didn't gel with the map's design and the other existing gameplay elements like bomb defusal. A bomb's been planted on our ammo supply! You need to be fast in exozombies. That's what the exosuit is there for, right? 
However, EMZs, EMZ dogs, and Goliaths can trigger an exo shutdown, which will slow you down. And since the zombies are roughly as fast as you, and the maps are cramped, and there's no sprint duration increase perk, well, put two and two together. As for Beast, to deal with ninjas, just don't sprint. Okay, easy enough. But then you upset that idea by introducing enemies that move faster than your standard walk speed, deal massive amounts of damage, and spawn in at the same time as the enemies you can't run away from. Now, how does all this relate to World War II? Well, game balance is where the Final Reich, Grosten House, and thankfully, the Darkest Shore excel. Okay, the Moishla kinda throws us for a loop, but we'll get into that later. The Final Reich's enemy balance was nearly perfect, with balance problems only manifesting in the form of bad spawns. Every enemy had specific weaknesses that an experienced player could exploit. The Darkest Shore may be smaller and more close quarters, but like the Final Reich, the map design itself flows well, is easily accessible to all types of players, the zombie spawns are well placed with multiple player movement taken into account, and the map offers quick ways to get around in the form of the minecarts. Oh shit, look at that already! Possible boyfriend, spotted! Don't always gotta be up to the man to make the first move. Yeah. Oh, idiot, what are you doing? You're rejecting me into a coma! The minecart transportation system is easily better than the disposal tubes of Final Reich as you can actually change where you'd like it to go and call it to your current location, much like the Mark IV tank from Origins. And lastly, the Pack-a-Punch method is very simple. I found it in my first game without looking up any guides, and I tend not to be very attentive when it comes to that kind of stuff. Like, at all. However, as I mentioned, the map itself is much more CQC than its predecessor, so it doesn't offer much in terms of kiting, which will disappoint some players. Almost as much as the fact that I just called it kiting. The last element of the gameplay that I feel is worth mentioning is the two new weapons that we found so far. The Ripsaw and the Pommel of Barbarossa. The Pommel is very simple. It's an area of effect tactical grenade that regenerates every 15 seconds. Nothing too special, but it's neat nonetheless. Then there's the Ripsaw, and uh, I love this weapon. A lot. I've executed hundreds of zombies with it, and I still don't find it boring at all. Come on, go on. Bone material. Kill you. Maybe I'm just easily amused, who knows. The atmosphere and vibe. The vibe of the Darkest Shore immediately sets itself apart from the previous two maps, whereas Final Reich and Grossen House were very dark and focused more on the science of Straub's work, this map is actually quite bright and has more of a tribal, culty feel to it. The atmosphere itself is wonderfully creepy and, just like the Final Reich, has a well-executed build-up to said creep, although I don't think it's as successful as its predecessor. It starts off normal enough with the players fighting off zombies on the brightest shore. Get it? Because the map's name is the darkest shore? But the shore you're fighting on is actually quite bright. But then you start progressing through the map and the feeling that something isn't right builds up. You start finding headless Nazi corpses and strung up bodies, then the remnants of Straub's twisted works, and finally, once you progress through the quest enough, Secret rooms dedicated to the Moishla's worship of their mother, the goddess of fertility, Nerthus. Then there's the fog, which I feel is very well executed and adds greatly to the atmosphere. I originally panned this on release, as I felt it cut down player reaction time far too much for a game where your success is based on how good your moment-to-moment -moment reactions are. Turns out I was completely wrong and just not used to its mechanics. See, zombies will completely ignore you in the fog, provided you don't fire a weapon. This allows you to sneak around unseen, but unless you knew this prior, you'd likely just run around like a chicken with its head cut off firing at everything that moves. It's what we've been doing for nearly a decade at this point, and it's worked out so far, right? What I'm trying to say is that the fog will screw you over if you're new to the map and don't know what you're doing, or if you fall back on old tried and true tactics. Once you get to learn the map though, you'll be able to travel through the fog with no issue. However, there is one enemy that can see you in the fog, the Moishla. Let's talk about these demon spawns. The Final Reich scared you by showing these horrific perversions of humanity, but because the map has been out for three months, we were kinda numb to that bag of tricks by the time the Darkest Shore released. Then the Moishla comes along and does the exact opposite. It relies on sound and the implication of perversion far more than the visuals to scare the player. And I gotta admit, it got me more than a couple times. Because they only come out with a fog, you never get a good look at them. I hadn't actually gotten a solid look at one until almost three weeks after release. Because most of your sightings, provided you're not doing quest runs, will be limited to a twisted silhouette lurking in the fog. It plays into the classic horror idea that your mind's interpretation is always more frightening than whatever's on screen. And to be honest, I feel that the Moishla is perfectly executed in this regard. With the map's design, atmosphere, and general gameplay covered, I think it's time to get into the story and characters, which, I'm just gonna preview, are my favorite part of the map. Like, let's just cast all professionalism aside for just a moment. 
This map's lore is fucking cool. That's very cool. That's, That's very it's cool. It's very cool. Yeah. The main story takes place mere days after the events of the Final Reich, and involves the MFAA tracking Straub's movement to an island, with our heroes being tasked with apprehending him. If everything goes well, nobody will fire a shot. Then there's the background lore. I was very skeptical on how the implementation of pagan gods was gonna go, but it ended up being my favorite aspect of the story so far. I find the idea of the Moishla's devotion to their mother Nerthus fascinating, and that they're intelligent enough to escape captivity, worship, and seemingly even have cliques of their own, evidenced by the outcast Moishla that appears during the map's main quest. Their intelligence opens the doors to tons of possibilities. Are they aware of what they are? Do they have a larger plan, or do they just think in the moment like animals? Was this Moishla shunned by the others for being a non-believer, or did the others believe it was simply the will of Nerthus? We may never know, but it's something we never really seen before in Zombies. One final detail I appreciated was the outcast fear and ultimate acceptance of death in the main quest. It adds a dark and slightly human element to these things we've previously only seen as monsters. That's my water tank again. Jesus fucking Christ, can I record anything? The increased character focus. This was one of my few problems with the base game content. Marie and Klaus Fischer were the primary focus, and as a result, the others kind of got lost in the shuffle. Like, honestly. After playing the Final Reich, what could you tell me about Jefferson? Or Olivia, for that matter. I bet you're blanking, huh? Don't worry, you're not alone. However, this is no longer really an issue. All of the characters get more depth this time around, but as with the Final Reich and Black Ops 3 season, one character gets the spotlight, and that's Drosten Hind. We get to learn about his previous life as a humanities professor, his reluctant time spent working for the Nazis on the island, and his wife and newborn child back home. Wait, was that even in the map? I also really liked seeing these four grow together as a team. At the start of the map, none of them really want to be there, and would rather just go home and hope the problem resolves itself. But as the map progresses, they all become invested in stopping Straub themselves and make the decision to actively hunt him down as they stow away on his zeppelin and head to Germany as a team. It's not as powerful as seeing premise come together throughout Black Ops 3, but I'll admit that I might have a slight bias to put it lightly. Now that we've gone over the big things I liked, just like the last video, let's go over the little things. The beach defense intro. I've been waiting almost seven goddamn years for a map to have a special intro like Moon, and by god it's finally here. In solo, it's a bit underwhelming since all the zombie zombies good. Since all the zombies simply shuffle towards you, but in co-op, they all sprint and it's pretty awesome. Despite the fact that their inclusion makes me angrier than John Bernthal's Punisher, the escorts do not take friendly fire damage or stray away from their intended path, unlike the ones from Garrod Krogan. These are admitted improvements that I feel deserve some praise. Reluctant praise, but praise nonetheless, I guess. The two new wall weapons. I love the M1A1 carbine and sawed off shotgun, so it's nice to see them no longer relegated to being starter weapon exclusives. If you fail to kill a bomber in the mining tunnels, you only take 20 points of damage, whereas normally you take 80. This completely eliminates potentially cheap deaths, provided you have some guide shot, of course. The doors, wall weapons, and mystery box on the island all have special locks where the player inserts their electrosh now, thus canonically explaining locked items and how they're opened. Dr. Straub makes a Return of the Jedi reference. Oh, I'm afraid the island defenses will be quite operational when your friends arrive. I have no idea why anybody wrote this in, but... They got a chuckle out of me. And lastly, the addition of 12 new special characters. Sure, they're just recolors of the game's launch characters, but it's nice to have some challenges for the really dedicated players. Although I gotta admit, I'm pretty disappointed there's no new bad agents or bad elites. Like, they have the coolest base game design, why not give them some cool new variants? How about this? Yeah, I love a man here in uniform. Does that do anything for you, idiot? Look at me. Nothing. Nothing! I'm fucking gorgeous, yo! Now that we've gone through what I liked about the Dark Ashore, it's time for the part where you think people would stop calling me a fanboy, but here we are. It's time for the stuff I didn't like. When people critique the Darker Shore, easily the most commonly discussed element is the lack of content compared to the Final Reich. And I can sympathize with this critique. For comparison, the Final Reich had the Tesla Gun, its four upgrade quests, the Red Talon Claymore, and two separate quest paths. But don't get it twisted, there was a lot you COULD do in the Final Reich. There wasn't a lot you HAD to do. 
This is what really prevents me from loving maps like Origins and Zetsubo no Shima. Every game, there's that checklist of stuff you borderline have to do for a good game. The final right gives you the option to do this busy work, but at no point, apart from powering on the bunker, does it force it on you. Now thankfully, The Darkest Shore continues this trend, but doesn't offer nearly as much as its precursor in terms of gameplay variety. That's not to say that the map is completely barren and there's nothing to do whatsoever. There's the buildable saw weapon, the Uberschnall and Fuse saw, a little side quest to upgrade it via the Uberspringen, the main quest, and... Uh... Shit. Yet another commonly discussed issue with the map is the balance of the new enemy type the Moishla. Earlier on in the video, I praised them for the genuinely unsettling vibe and said that they didn't ruin gameplay per se, but I won't bullshit you either. I personally feel that they're slightly broken. Well, okay, maybe broken's too harsh a word. Unbalanced. Yeah, that's nicer. And for those who think I'm over-exaggerating and that I'm, I just need to get good, let me list off their abilities real quick. They're much smarter than the average zombie and will actively make an attempt to flank you. A single Moishla has the power to dish out up to 170 damage in under 3 seconds. This is enough to take out a single point of Geist Child from max health. Or, if there's two Moishlas in play, enough to kill you nearly instantly. Speaking of which, multiple Moishlas can spawn in at once, even in solo play. Their movement speed is significantly faster than a standard zombie. They don't obey the rules of certain specials like Sustain Zone. And finally, Jack in the Boxes only temporarily distract them. All of this, combined with the fact that they have the health of like 46 Brenners, adds up to a slightly problematic enemy that throws the meta for a loop. Sure, he can occasionally be forced into a retreat from taking too much damage, but unlike the Wooslings Enragement, it's incredibly inconsistent. I can't tell you how many times I've laid into it with everything I had, and they just don't stop coming, and they don't stop coming, and they don't stop coming, and they don't stop coming. I personally like the idea of fighting a smarter type of zombie that's pretty hard to take down, since I found the Brenner to be kind of a pushover. Anyone want to I don't see him. <laughs> But in execution, I feel the end product is a slight misfire in an otherwise incredibly well-balanced enemy pool. Okay, so I feel like I need to add a little addendum here. If you use a very specific mod and weapon combo, you can actually one-hit kill a Moishla. You need to take frontline with Vicious and hand-to-hand, -hand, then just charge at them with your saw. I didn't find this, by the way. That credit goes to Glitching Queen, I think. So yeah, they're kind of unbalanced, but if you're willing to alter your loadout entirely, you can deal with them easily. Okay, back to the video. The changes made to the notebook system. This is a big one for me personally. Despite the fact that I'm quite good at these games at this point, I still appreciated the addition of the notebook guide system in the Final Reich and its prologue. It was such a breath of fresh air to be given a guide instead of having to go on YouTube and look at a 45 minute long video just to turn on power. But now that it no longer lists your current objectives, I feel the game has lost a little bit of what made it unique and that this change may alienate some casual players. Honestly though, no matter what the team did regarding the mechanic, it's a losing battle. If you keep it, you risk pissing off people who feel that it makes the game too handholdy, and on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have a reaction similar to mine. I do not envy the job of game designers in the slightest. The main quest. I'm on record saying that I love the Final Reich's quest, apart from the Zeppelin step. The steps made sense, didn't require you to do a bunch of heavy lifting, and even without the notebook, most players could probably still figure out what to do. And then we get to this map, and it's uh, it's not great. Which is a damn shame because it starts off really good. The first step involves getting the head of Red Riding Hood to open up the corpse gate. And you know what, let's talk about this thing real quick. Creating a lock that only opens through ripping apart a resurrected corpse is fucking twisted beyond belief yet I can't help but love it. And the execution, pun completely intended by the way, of the unlocking IGC is wonderfully done. When I first saw it, I thought the body would just explode into a bloody mist because of how models tend to work in these games, and it's admittedly easier to spam a blood effect over, you know, actually putting work into something. But I was, uh, I was wrong. Boy, was I. I'm a then after that, we get a cameo appearance from the Brenner, Anyone want to RP? only to immediately have to fight off a squadron of Stukas with flat cannons, and sink the incoming German warships. Got it. These steps are all great. So how could this go wrong? 
Oh, yep, escort missions are back. I don't think I can accurately convey to you with words how much I hate these. Not just in this map, but in every game ever. They sucked in Infection, they sucked even more somehow in Gorod Krovi, and they suck here. Especially the one where you have to lead the whistling around the map and perk him up. I've had runs where I hug the wall so much that I feel like I'm becoming part of it, but he'll still go for stamina up and ruin the entire thing. So then I have to wait until he dies, get another charge of Whistling Spine, and try again, only for it to happen again. These escorts are a massive misfire in an otherwise well-designed main quest that honestly makes me not even want to bother with the... Okay, here we go. Meister Moishla, I think I said it right, fight. It's a really cool fight, but by that point I'm so annoyed from the escort missions that I just want to go lie down and sleep for a couple weeks. That's pretty bleak, dude. It's just a video game. And finally, as much as I love the story, background lore, and increased character focus, I'd be remiss in mentioning the few flaws I have with it. For starters, the lack of an emotional connection. Despite the increased character interactions, I don't feel as emotionally involved in the quest this time around. The final Reich had Marie fighting to save her brother and her ultimate failure to do so. This felt a bit more grounded and relatable, whereas in The Darkest Shore, we don't really get something like this. But what personally bugs me more is that the voice deliveries are still kind of hit or miss. David Tennant and Udo Kier, the latter of which I didn't really talk about all that much last time, are still easily the strongest performers. Catherine Winnick and Elodie Young, I said it right this time, have improved since the last map, but unfortunately, they still have a few clunkers in there. And the most disappointing, like last time, is Ving Rhames as Jefferson. You got to be kidding me! The material he's given this time is actually quite good, but I feel that he's either miscast, not all that into the role, or just hasn't been given proper direction. He's not bad per se, but I feel that he's lacking compared to the other four main players. To round this section off, just like with the positives, I have some little things to mention that I don't think really warrant an entire paragraph. These range from legitimate problems to really silly nitpicks. Alright, let's go. Moishless can spawn during the fire room step. This is absolute nonsense. The Pack-a-Punch camo barely shows up on your guns in this map. If I had to guess, I'd say the camo's material doesn't have use gameplay intensity ticked off. The fact that they reused this exact same take in the intro. Oh. The Sons of Nerthus statues reuse the gridiron ball anims. This just looks silly, especially the fact that it retains the ADS mechanic of the Brenner head. Like, why? Why would you do this? The fall from the secret chamber is just high enough for you to take fall damage. So theoretically, if you exited in a hurry with no Geist Child, this can result in a cheap and completely unavoidable death. Jefferson's grease gun has ridiculously exaggerated recoil, muzzle flash, and sound. I can't help but think he was supposed to be holding a shotgun or some other high power weapon at some point. And lastly, Marie's Uber Chanel clips directly through her arm in the outro. Oof. So, in conclusion, while I do think it's a very good map that makes some market improvements over the Final Reich, I feel that the Darkest Shore is overall a bit of a come down. There's nowhere near as many gameplay options, and the balance of the Moishla is... questionable at best. Despite this, I still feel that it has the strongest map lore in Zombies history that actually takes some unexpected turns, a wonderfully creepy atmosphere, and solid map design. I also personally really appreciate the increased character focus, despite the fact that there was no real emotional hook this time around. The main problem I, and a lot of other players seem to have, like I mentioned before, is the fact that there's just not all that much to do. If there were more side objectives or buildables like the Final Reich, we easily would have had another home run on our hands. But as it stands, we still have a really solid triple, which is nothing to scoff at. Here's hoping the DLC season can keep up this perfect batting average. Baseball joke. Well, that's all for today. At the top of the video, I promised I'd address this whole done with YouTube thing. So here we go. I was burnt out and I needed a break, plain and simple. Let's also address the recent tonal shift. As my longtime viewers know, a lot of my older content is very negative and uses that as a primary source of comedy. Sure, the videos might have been funny, but that negativity started bleeding into my real life and my personality. So that's why going forward, I'm going to try and be as positive and constructive as I possibly can be. Let me also clarify, this isn't going to be a full, I'm back, let's make a ton of videos kind of thing. I'm just going to make stuff when inspiration strikes and ultimately return to YouTube just being a hobby. What does that mean exactly? 
Well, that means that the next video could be tomorrow. It could be six months from now. Stay tuned. Anyway, thank you for watching. Have a great day, and hopefully I'll see you soon. Hey everyone, Rizzo here. And before we get into the video proper, I'd like to issue a quick little disclaimer. In case you were unaware, I was invited out to Sledgehammer Games' studio to play the map early a couple weeks ago. Just figured I'd get that out of the way now, in case you believe that clouds my judgment or invalidates the review or whatever the internet believes. With that out of the way, let's get into the video. Before we settle into the armrests of the Shadowed Throne, Okay, that one was kind of a stretch. I'd like to, once more, go over the changes we've seen to the mode since the release of the last map, The Darkest Shore. And, again, if you'd just like to skip to my thoughts on the map itself, go to the on-screen timestamp. So, let's recap. Like last time, the game has changed significantly over the past few months. Sadly, we haven't seen any new mods or consumables, which is admittedly kind of disappointing. But regardless, let's focus on what we do have. We've seen numerous bug fixes and weapon rebalances, most notable being the buff of the Enfield No. 2's ammo count, and the fixing of Gung Ho when combined with dual wield weapons. Before patch, you would still have to play the Sprint Out animation before firing. Because of this, Gung Ho saw very limited usage at least by me. Fall damage has been completely removed from the game, so no more dying or losing Geist Child pieces just because you have the audacity to jump from something three feet off the ground. Seven new weapons have been added that can be used across all the maps. The MG81, M38, E-Traverse Assault Rifle, M2 Carbine, 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 someone will correct me, Type 5, Sterling, and of course, the Type 38 Sniper Rifle. Still no new shotguns though. Kinda disappointing, but what can you do? What can you do? The supplies tab has been added to the zombies main menu. From here you can pick up your mail, visit the quartermaster, see Rideau's dead horrifying eyes, and last but certainly not least, you can pick up your long touted contracts and orders. We've been waiting for these for quite a few months, and I gotta say, they were well worth the wait. These add a ton of replayability to the game, and personally keep me coming back every day to see what's new. It also lets me build up armory credits and supply drops each day just by relaxing and killing the undead, instead of having to sweat my ass off in multiplayer. Why they weren't there earlier on, we can only speculate. Probably had something to do with really tight DLC schedules and a relatively small zombies team compared to the multiplayer and campaign guys. But like I said, they're here now, and like Frosted Flakes, they're great. So it's safe to say that the game is in an even better place than we left it a couple months ago. And just like last time, the voice of God himself has promised a bunch of cool new stuff coming soon. So it's probably just gonna keep getting better. And finally, with all the changes covered, it's time to get into the Shadowed Throne. As we always do, we'll start first with the positives and then move into the negatives later. The map design and flow. Like the other maps in World War II, the map's design and general flow is very solid. However, like the Darkest Shore, the map is very close quarters and doesn't offer a lot of kiting opportunities. I'm never gonna stop saying kiting. The only solid kiting area in the entire map is the Hidden Courtyard, which requires you to do most of the map's main quest to unlock. The map's special weapon variety. Let's list off what we got so far. There might even be more. The Wonderbus, six new melee weapons, I believe? No, seven, seven, the blade. And even the previous map's wonder weapons like the Ripsaw and Tesla Gut return through the Hangman Easter Egg in the square. This really helps spice up the gameplay, especially when compared to the rather lacking weapon selection of the Darkest Shore. The melee weapons and their differing form of attack. Unlike Raven and the Redwoods, the melee weapons are actually very different from one another, and each suits a different kind of playstyle. For example, the Trench Knife and the Dancer's Dagger are more suited to a defensive playstyle whereas the Ice Pick and Nazi Axe are purely made for offense and actively encourage aggressive play. You can probably guess which one I gravitated towards. Sadly, I didn't find the Smuggler's Bat to be all that useful. It just seemed like it had no niche to fill compared to the rest of the weapons on offer. Kind of like the FG-42 that got nerfed 48 separate times. The style and consistency of the world. Like the Darkest Shore to the Final Reich, the Shadow Throne immediately sets itself apart from the previous entry by changing up the map's style and tone, while at the same time, making sure it feels stylistically consistent with the rules of the previously established universe. 
This is something that World War II has received some flack for. Some people say that all the maps feel a bit too samey, so to speak. But I personally feel like this is one of the game's greatest strengths. The technology and style intentionally remains consistent across all maps, making every experience feel, to quote the man himself, like a different chapter in the same story. Compare this to Zelensky's Black Ops 2 universe. Nuketown, Transit, Die Rise, love him or hate him, felt like a consistent universe, and it made it a lot easier to get invested in the world they were setting up. And then, I think you know where I'm going with this, Buried comes in and completely ruins it. Aside from abandoning all interesting plot threads set up by the previous entries, it further estranges itself from the story by completely changing the style and tone set up in the previous maps. Those maps painted a picture of a desperate, destroyed world, where the few remaining survivors tore each other apart due to paranoia brought on by two ethereal puppet masters with incompatible demands. Barry dropped all of that in favor of an awkward, cartoonish western town with no references made to the previous lore. An 18 billion foot tall goofball and... ghosts for no reason. The point I'm trying to make here is that the importance of a consistent narrative and universe cannot be overstated. It's how you hook an audience and get them invested. And as we saw with Buried, Shadows of Evil, and kind of the origin saga in general, when you deviate too far from what you set up, the response can be lukewarm, to put it lightly. The sound design. One thing I've constantly praised World War II for has been its sound design. Everything from the subtle environmental noises to the primitive, animalistic screech of the Moishla, the sound design is an aspect that this game has consistently nailed, and the Shadow Throne is no different. Being a war-torn city, there's constant screaming, gunfire, and explosions going on all around you, which, like Gorod Krovi, really helps sell the environment. But the best bit of sound design is the wail of the new zombie type, the Gekkok. Let's talk about this guy real quick. My first encounter with him was the only time I was scared during this map. Primarily being, you don't expect that high-pitched wail and insane movement speed. I expected your standard whistling-esque roar, where it's low and grumbly and weird, and a slightly faster movement speed, but nope, that fucker books it. I also really like him from a gameplay stance. Being a player that's constantly on the move, I appreciate that there's a zombie type that keeps me on my toes. It's like the Varuk Sprinters, but even more horrifying, the vocal performances. Like I predicted in my initial coverage of the game, the actors have largely begun settling into their roles and embodying their characters a bit better, especially Catherine Winnick. In the final right, quite a few of her and Ving's lines were hampered by awkward deliveries. That sounds like flies buzzing, but it's too cold for flies. Which is to be expected at first, I guess. The Ultimus crew went through it back in Shino Numa. Malcolm McDonald's had a couple clunkers in Garrod Krovi before improving in Revelation. What to do? What to do? I didn't say he was perfect, okay? And while I hate their characters in air quotes, God, I just did air quotes in real life with my fingers. What an asshole. The Infinite Warfare Zombies cast admittedly got much better as the season went on. While we're on the topic of dialogue, you might be asking, Well, Rizzo, you go on about the dialogue, but you almost always play as special characters. Why not play as the main four? Well, this is why. Those oversized lawn darts are our best chance to pop this balloon. Those oversized lawn darts are our best chance to pop lawn this balloon. Darts are our best chance Those oversized lawn darts are our best chance to pop this balloon. Every single round, the characters just won't shut up. Yeah, I get it, Drosten. We need to take down the Led Zeppelin, but maybe I don't want to do that this game. Maybe I just want to relax for an hour or so and kill some zombies. Those oversized lawn darts are our best chance to pop this balloon. The map's story. While I don't find it as enthralling as the lore of the Moishlas and Nerthus from the Darkest Shore, the Shadow Throne continues the logical and grounded event progression established in the previous two maps. Straub's Reich was created to assist the Nazis toward the end of the war, so it's only logical that at some point we'd see it used on the front line. It's also logical that everything that could go wrong would go wrong for every side. The Russians were forced to retreat, the citizens of Berlin were to be slaughtered in their homes by Straub to help cleanse the fatherland. And of course, since we killed Straub, his army would get out of control and everything would be kind of screwed. Speaking of which, Straub dies. Holy shit, I did not see this coming so early in the season. Sure, I figured he would go down eventually, but we're only halfway through the season and the main villain is super dead. This was a really pleasant surprise after three relatively predictable zombie seasons. Maybe it was four. Yes, I know, the final maps in each of these games were unexpected, but the journey there was pretty point A to point B. Still can't believe they drug extinction out of mothballs. 
Now that we're through the big things, it's time once again to get into the little things that help round out the experience. The radio frequency puzzle. I love this puzzle, primarily because you can actually figure this one out without video help. When I incorrectly entered the frequency, I noticed after a while that there were some numbers on top of it. So I went back to the chart in the church and tried aligning the numbers I saw on top to those of the chart, and voila, it worked. It was a nice little eureka moment. Speaking of the radio, the new unlockable in-map camo. All you have to do is just set your frequency to 3535, I believe, and you get a new camo. You can actually see Russian soldiers fighting zombies on occasion. It's a nice touch that helps sell the world just a wee bit more. And if you're feeling particularly mischievous, you can execute them if you're quick enough. Kinda completely changes the tone of the story to have one of our characters brutally execute a Russian ally. The classic PPSH is back, the hangman easter egg and the goodies it can give you. There's three new special characters that aren't reskins. You can easily identify the type of weapon you need to give the smuggler. You can also save him from dying via whistling if you give him an upgraded version of said weapon. Saving him has no real effect on gameplay, story, or the quest itself, but it's just a nice little easter egg. Okay, turns out I was wrong and saving the smuggler is actually canonical. Not only that, but he was so thankful for us helping him that he actually joins the Bureau of Archaic Technologies and becomes a necromatic special character. I've said it countless times, but it really is the little things, you know? So where does this map leave us story-wise? Well, we have all the pieces to Barbarossa's sword, Straub is dead, his army is unleashed upon Berlin, and our cast of canonical allies could potentially expand, what with Redogue's- Oh, fuck off. Again? And our cast of canonical allies could potentially expand, what with Redogue recruiting specialists after the events of the Darkest Shore. Yes, I know that last part technically wasn't mentioned in-game, and was just something Cameron said on Twitter, but shh. It's all canon to me. Speaking of which, Cameron said on Zombros that this will be the last map where Straub's Reich will be confined to the shadows, and that things are going to get much bigger going forward. And to be honest, this has me very worried, primarily because of how this jump in storytelling went last time. Let's flash back to Exo Zombies. DLC 2 was the map where the zombie outbreak went public and, in the words of Oz, blazed like a firestorm across the Western Hemisphere, consuming everyone and everything in its path. But it's also where the story became a hackneyed mess of underdeveloped, unfocused ideas. It couldn't decide if it wanted to focus on the five characters or be this big, epic zombies adventure. And because of that, it completely fell apart and destroyed any goodwill that they had built up with the previous maps. I know it's not fair to judge this game based on the mistakes of a previous one, but like I said, I can't help but be a bit worried about the future. And with that, I feel that it's time to get into the part of the video that I always edit first because it's admittedly much easier to get in depth about the things you don't like. That's right, it's time for the bad. As with any map, yes, even Mob of the Dead, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There's always something to take issue with, and the Shadow Throne is no exception. Starting off with the lack of scare factor. The Final Reich and the Darker Shore both had some brilliantly crafted scares, but aside from the previously mentioned Whale of the Gekok, I'm just gonna call him the Sizzler, I can't pronounce this right. But aside from the previously mentioned Whale of the Sizzler, I was never really scared in any of my playthroughs. Which was a bit of a disappointment, as I really dug the full-on horror take of the Final Reich and the Darkest Shore. It was fun to be scared of zombies again, especially since the last time I felt that was... Verrucked back in 2009. Personally, I'd really like to see the future maps return to a spookier atmosphere and not fall into the trapping of if it's bigger, it's better. Moving on, for as well as the map flows, I'd be remiss in mentioning the few issues I have with it. Primary being that certain lanes in the map are far too narrow. Mainly, I'm talking about the drop pod doors. They're only large enough for a single player's hitbox to easily get through at once. So if a zombie, or worse yet, a whistling, just so happens to be coming through on a higher round where killing them quickly is not a possibility, then it can result in one of those dreaded what the hell was I supposed to even do moments that, funny enough, the other besieged World War II zombies map had, but for entirely different and more annoyingly frequent reasons. <coughs> the pack-a-punch method restricts the use of throwing knives or bouncing betties in solo. Since you need explosives to open the wall panels, you have to pack some form of throwable grenade in your loadout. The only ways to circumvent this in solo are to acquire the Fliegerfaust by pure chance, or have the Mark II mod, Free Fire, and an M1911. Personally, I find this decision quite baffling. Speaking of baffling, it's time for the big one, the main quest. 
I know that it was a conscious decision to make the game harder for solo players, but oh man do I have some problems with this. Many steps are not solo friendly. The safe for instance. If you're not using camouflage or shell shock, well, tough shit for you. But Rizzo, couldn't you just wait until the round is transitioning and then open it? Well, that's a good idea. In theory. But in practice, by the time you're just about to line up that final number, the round transition graphic is going to pop up right in front of the dial and you won't be able to properly line it up. Did I mention that the safe is super sensitive to how you line things up the Morse code and statue steps? I think I said this during my review of the Beast from Beyond, but I'll say it here again. Any step where I have to look up an external source or write things down on a notepad immediately makes me hate it. Previous examples of this include the gas valves in Gorod Krovi where you had to go to Milo's website, the alchemy in Attack of the Radioactive Tragedy where you had to look at this giant Google Docs document that is no longer available, and Neil's floppy disks in The Beast from the East. However, there is a slight positive to the Morse code. See, there's only a certain amount of possible Morse code audio files that can play. So you can just write down every example you've ever seen, put them in a little notepad document, and just put them in until you unlock the cabinet by sheer chance. I've done this like six times. The boss fight. The boss itself, I'm not gonna lie, his design is super cool, but he just doesn't stand out or have much of a presence during the actual fight, especially when compared to previous bosses. The best examples of bosses that make an impact and stand out during the fights are the Keeper, the Dragon and Manicor Mech, Silent Bob, Mephistopheles, the Panzer Mortar, and the Meister Moishles. All of these bosses, occasionally questionable game design aside, stand out and have a genuine presence in game. Whereas the Stadjäger just kind of blends into the crowd of 40 whistlings. It's really hard to feel threatened by a boss when half the time I'm asking, Okay, is that the main boss or is it just another whistling? That crowd of whistlings actually leads me into my next point. The special enemy spawn points and spawn rates. The spawn rates feel a bit too high for how close quarters and cramped the map is. I feel the previous two maps achieved a near perfect balance in this category, but in the Shattered Throne, it feels like the Whistlings and Bombers pile up way too quickly in the higher rounds. And lastly, Ryan Gosling's The Notebook still isn't back. I know, I know, it'll probably never return and was likely just a tool to familiarize new players with the mode, but its absence still fills my heart with sadness. And now that we've covered the main things I took issue with, let's take a minute or three to go over the more nitpicky stuff. During the intro, Jefferson appears to have a cut line, but they left in the animation data for said line, so it just looks like he's flapping his gums for no reason. There's no animation or effects for when the boards collapse under you in the square. They just disappear. The Ripsaw is missing all sounds associated with a heavy attack. The Wonder Bus's battery model disappears when you get more than a couple feet away from it, and since the accompanying effects aren't all that pronounced, you might miss it if you're just glancing around the area. In the square, whistlings can clip directly through the bus next to the cabaret, so you'll just be minding your own business when suddenly a whistling charges right through a solid object. At least they don't get stuck there forever like gargoyles. Next to the bar wall by, there's a zombie spawn that isn't particularly well placed, so you can just see zombies pop in from another dimension kind of takes you out of the immersion when zombies just up here, you know? The Nail Bat's world model isn't properly aligned with the dead soldier's hand, so it just kind of floats there. Where are the bat variants? When Straub dies, he has no face posing. That immediately took me out of the moment on my first viewing. Instead of feeling shocked that, holy shit, the main antagonistic force is dead already? I was too busy thinking, I wonder why they didn't give his death animation the appropriate face posing. I mean, the model still has the bones in game and everything. On the topic of face posing, the Russian soldiers lack face posing as well, which makes executing them all the more awkward. They just blankly stare at you while you jam a knife into their eye. Oh fuck, I can't believe you've done this. Seriously, there's still no new bats. When Rideau arrives in the outro, there's no sound effect present for him hitting the zombie behind the Meistermoischel. I feel like I'm missing something. Can't quite remember. Oh right, the launch! Why would this be a bad thing? It was like a 30 minute diversion that gave me a bit of a giggle. At least it wasn't like Outbreak where the download was bugged for season pass holders for 13 hours. Oh yeah, did I mention that happened a second time with Infection? So, in conclusion, I feel that the Shadowed Throne is a sizable improvement over the Darkest Shore that addresses many of the common complaints of said map. Its weapon variety is fantastic, the traps are effective again, and there's just much more meat on the bone this time around. However, like I said, it does fumble in some other areas. Primary being that the special enemy spawn rate feels a bit excessive for the map's layout, and the map's tone veers a bit too far into action territory for my liking. 
I get that the latter is more personal preference than anything, but I figured I'd mention it regardless. If these two issues weren't there, this would easily be my favorite map of the game, but as it stands, I think I like the Final Reich a wee bit more. Which is no small feat, mind you. The Final Reich is one of my favorite zombies maps to date, so of course, topping it is gonna be hard in my eyes. But the fact that they even got close is a damn good sign. Regardless, I really enjoyed this map, and I'll likely be playing it far into the future, whereas I kinda tuned out of the Dark Ashore a couple weeks after I posted my review. Well, that's all for today. If you enjoyed, there's a playlist down in the description that contains all the other long-winded reviews I've made in the past. Some of them aren't as good as the newer ones, I'll admit, but it's interesting to see where you've come from, you know? Anyway, thanks for watching, and have a great day. Hey everyone, Rizzo here. And before we get into the video proper, I'd like to issue a quick little disclaimer. I was invited out to Sledgehammer Games' studio back in mid-June to play this map early. I know early access events are a big point of contention in the community, so I figured I'd just get that out of the way right up front. And with the air cleared, let's get into the video. Before we walk the tortured path, I'd like to, as always, go over what's happened in the downtime since the release of the Shattered Throne. And just like always, if you'd like to skip to my thoughts on the map itself, just go to the on-screen timestamp. With that out of the way, let's recap. Like the time between DLC 1 and 2, a lot has happened in the world of World War II zombies since the release of the Shattered Throne. Regardless of what internet comments would have you believe, the orders and contracts have been slightly retooled and now offer zombies consumable drops in addition to the standard credits and supply drop rewards. A jack-in-the-box guarantee consumable has been added. I personally never got one though. The pack-a-punch delay has almost been entirely removed. Previously, there was a very noticeable delay between the time the pack-a-punch sound finished and being able to actually pick up your weapon. Now, as soon as that sound finishes, you can pick up your weapon. The Blitz purchase times have been adjusted. Your first purchase will still be rather slow, but after that, you completely skip the extra handshake part and get right back into the action. This is something that has been a long time coming, but it's good to see it finally here regardless. With the Liberty Strike event, special contracts were available that allowed you to unlock Moonraven variants of the Mountaineer, Survivalist, Hunter, Slayer, and Not the Bat. Eight new weapons have been added to the Mystery Box's global rotation. The Nambu Type 2, the fan favorite PTRS-41, Stinger LMG, Blunderbuss, Lever Action, the ZK-383 SMG, the AVS-36 Assault Rifle, and lastly, the Delio Sniper Rifle. But these weapons aren't without issue. The PTRS and the Lever Action both lack snap aim, and only receive aim assist when you hold your breath. Only problem is, you can't hold your breath in zombies for some reason. So for console players, this makes the weapon significantly harder to use than it should be especially when the other sniper rifles get the snap aim function. PC players are totally fine though. The final, yet easily most important thing, well, to me at least, all the extra lore and world building. For starters, we finally got confirmation that Bat Agent and Elite are actually Vivian Harris from the campaign and Major Rideau respectively. Where'd that happen? Well, turns out you can just ask Cameron things on Twitter and he'll be like, yeah, I won't lie, I personally always thought it was just lazy asset reuse and who knows? It might have originally been that, but then someone said, Okay, but what if we do this? Alright, back up a second, Rizzo. Who the hell's Vivian and why does that matter? Oh, right! I forgot that no one actually plays Campaign. Maybe they'd be better off just removing it from the next one. Oh, wait. Anyway, she's an SOE operative that made a minor appearance in the first act of World War II's Campaign. Continuing with the out-of-game lore, the Drosten files and the community updates have been replaced by letters from the Bureau of Archaic Technologies written from either the perspective of Rideau or Vivian. Much like Marie's journal entries, none of the information in these letters is essential to understanding the game's overall story, unlike the timeline. But for those who like doing the extra homework, it's a nice little bonus. Although I completely understand why people don't like this kind of stuff and just want it all to be in-game. The Attack of the Undead event officially tied the multiplayer universe into the zombie story as well. So that means that campaign, zombies, and multiplayer are, in some ways, all tied together. Canonically, Attack of the Undead takes place between the Shadowed Throne and the Tortured Path, and with Sledgehammer's way of letting us experience a spread of Straub's Reich across Europe firsthand. I know this is all oddly specific to harp on, but I love canonic crossovers and supplemental material like this that enriches the lore. It's one of the reasons I... 
kinda like the 343 era of Halo. Aside from what's already in the game, multiple upcoming changes have been publicly revealed. There's the weapon variant perk rework, and special contracts, but more importantly, during a playthrough of the Tortured Path on IGN, Cameron revealed that they're finally going to be tuning whistlings. It hasn't been revealed exactly what they're going to do, but judging by the conversation, if I had to guess, it'll likely have to do with the spawn rates and perhaps even the spawn cap. I personally really hope it's the latter, because as funny as it is to hoard a crowd of clubmen, from an artistic and lore standpoint, it's kind of silly. Also gameplay. Yeah, it sucks from a gameplay stance that this can even happen. Alright, turns out I was right and they're going to be globally tuning the whistling spawn rates. Okay, back to the video. Now, with all the changes discussed, we're finally caught up to the present day. So I'd say it's about time we finally started walking the tortured path. Never getting tired of that joke. As always, I'd like to start with what I enjoyed about this DLC, so that when I get into the bad stuff, it'll make my complaint seem legitimate because I looked at the game from both angles. Too transparent? Yeah, probably. Easily the most impressive thing about this DLC is how rich its world building and story is. Set several months after the events of the Shadowed Throne, Straub's undead forces have ravaged across Europe, with Nazi propaganda painting it as, to quote Rideau, a brilliant attempt by the Fuhrer to call upon the lost sons of this final Reich to defend the fatherland. Truth of the matter is, both sides are suffering heavy losses as the Nazi Schaefers have had little luck controlling the undead forces. In response, President Truman authorized the creation of the Bureau of Archaic Technologies, and members of the Manhattan Project were tasked with reverse engineering captured electrosnow devices. Over the next few months, the Bureau would attempt to reforge the sword and strategically strike key military points in the Nazi regime, until learning of an operation created by Adolf Hitler in response to Operation High Jump to find Thule. This then leads Rideau to task Marie, Drosten, Jefferson, Olivia, the Mountaineer, and the Smuggler with journeying to New Swabia for answers regarding the sword, much to the dismay of Vivian as the Allied forces are already spread far too thin for such a mission. All of this story happens before the first cutscene. Told you there was a lot here. I'm not going to recap the entire story in this video, because A, there is a lot here to talk about, and B, Reed actually made a really good video explaining just about everything, so there will be a link to his video in the description if you're interested in learning more. Seriously though, it's a really good video. Go check it out if you haven't already. Still on the topic of story, I want to talk about Across the Depths' weirdo acid trip. After filling some Uber Chanel batteries, we're teleported to... Okay, I have no idea what this is. Here, we see relics of the previous maps and get a couple cameo appearances from Dr. Straub. As awesome and trippy as all this weirdness is, I have one question about it. How are these characters even seeing this stuff? In Chapter 2, we play as the Bureau operatives, and the Bureau recruits were never present to see these events for themselves. They didn't hear Straub say anything about catching Klaus, firebombing Middleburg, or see his demise in Berlin. I don't know if there's something going on with the Geistcraft and Barbarossa or manipulation or whatever, or who knows, maybe it's just an oversight by the writers. Everyone gets one. The characterization of the Bureau operatives and Jefferson Potts. While the stuff for the Bureau operatives is admittedly a bit simple, it's nice to finally have names and basic personalities for all these neat little side characters we've been seeing since launch. Of course, Rideau and Vivian are the strongest of the lot, simply because we've already seen and interacted with these characters before in different parts of the game. I just really hope we haven't seen the last of them and they get even more development next time. Hell, I'd be fine if they didn't even do it in-game and they just gave us some character bios in the community updates like ExoZombies. Wink wink. As for Jefferson, he's the one that gets the spotlight in Beneath the Ice, and we finally get to learn a bit more about him. We get to learn about his past and what made him into the man he is today, along with some... borderline uncomfortable dialogue. You got an issue with authority? I'm a black man from the ass end of Arkansas, Professor. What do you think authority has usually meant to me? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck! Ah, oh, shit! I wasn't <laughs> ready for that! Now that we're through the story and the characters, let's get into what I liked about the gameplay. The addition of Richter's, quote-unquote, greatest achievement, the Waffen Boxes. Or maybe it's Waffen Boxes. I don't know. I love the random element they bring to gameplay. As much as I like being able to get exactly what I want, there's a certain satisfaction that comes with rolling the dice and hitting it big. 
I have a gambling problem. The Rocketin Brenner and Guardian boss fights. Both of these bosses are well executed and fun to fight. The Geistcraft shield of the Rocketin Brenner requires the player to lure him to missile strikes around the play space to temporarily break it. And while the Guardian may not be shielded, he's something you always have to keep an eye on. After taking enough damage, he'll retreat to the center of the map and attempt to heal himself. So you'll need to stay vigilant throughout the entire fight. The Stott Jaeger, on the other hand, is... Boring as sin. Literally no strategy is involved whatsoever. You just shoot it until it kills itself. It's a bit disappointing. The objective variety and overall balance of set objectives. The biggest change up to this DLC's formula is the addition of objective rounds similar to the ones found in Exozombies. On rounds 3, 6, and 9, you have to complete a random objective to progress. This can range from shooting down a Zeppelin prototype, defeating a horde of Moishlas, defending a power supply, assassinating a VIZ, repairing radios, disarming bombs, etc. There's a very healthy amount of objectives to keep the game fresh and to keep you on your toes. Not all of them are created equal, however but we'll get to that later. So here's the question I bet some of you are rightfully asking. Why do you find the objective rounds to be fun here when you are so against their inclusion in Exozombies? Well, it's because I feel like those rounds impeded on standard gameplay and were not balanced to fit with the pace of the game. For example, as early as wave six, I think, you'd have to escort a brain dead survivor across the entire map while vicious hordes of zombies rain down on your position. If you didn't have full contact grenades, distraction drones, and a fair bit of luck on your side, you were very likely to fail, which in turn would shut down all power across the map. Or how about the bomb defuse on Carrier? Fight a ton of special zombies, scramble to reach the bomb in time, only to have to face off against Atlas strike teams armed to the teeth. Oh, and did I mention that the zombies will completely ignore them? The Tortured Path, on the other hand, is built with these objectives in mind, and the player has far more tools at their disposal to assist them. Do you need to defend an objective? Pop Frontline to lure them away. Have a horde of Meister Moishlas on your tail early on? Free Fire with a Mark II mod will make short work of them. But that also brings up a problem. Because of how unpredictable the objectives can be, if you want to play efficiently, you don't have all that much wiggle room as a solo player. I've tried so many loadouts, but there's only one or two that pretty much guarantee success. In co-op, as always, you have a lot more freedom, but once again, solo players kind of get the shaft. Once you reach max bureau rank, you'll gain access to the darkened path. This is essentially the game's hard mode. It increases zombie health, speed, spawn numbers, boss health, and ups the special zombie spawn rate to ludicrous levels. Personally, this isn't exactly my cup of tea, primarily because I'm admittedly not good enough to complete it, but I do appreciate the addition nonetheless. Now it's time to list off the little things that, while they may not be game changing, they help make the experience just a little bit better. Each map has a unique Pack-a-Punch camo. I guarantee Milo really appreciated this one. The FOV and gun position when you're affected by Geistcraft looks really good. Maybe make it a toggleable option in the graphics menu? The Mountaineer's fur physics in the cutscenes I'm 99% sure he was the one picked to accompany our heroes simply because an animator wanted to show off. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's three brand new special unlockable characters for the hardcore crowd. The Cavalier, Lady Death, and the Iron Tiger. Upon completion of each map's easter egg, you'll be rewarded with a new camo for use in weapon kits. Bordeaux now dons his elite uniform in the zombie supply tab and the headquarters. Our main four actually changed their outfits to better suit their environment. I don't think that's literally ever happened before. By the way, Richtofen on Ascension doesn't count. That's just weird and confusing. Klaus makes a cameo appearance in Chapter 3. While his appearance doesn't seem to have any major story implications yet, it's nice to see an old face again, even if he is just a spooky specter. So that's everything I liked about the Tortured Path. Sounds like quite a bit, right? Well, that's because it is. But like every map, there's some things I didn't like so much. So without further delay, let's get into the bad. Let's start from the beginning. The intro cutscene is completely disconnected from the actual game. The cutscene ends with a shot of our crew journeying to Thule to fight zombies and reforge Barbarossa's sword. But then we jump, very suddenly and without proper transition, to the middle of a rundown village in Spain. We must utterly destroy them. I didn't edit this at all, by the way. This is actually how it transitions in real time. It would have made more sense for the cutscene to do that thing that the Modern Warfare games did, where it zooms out to an overhead view of the world, it can move from Thule to Spain, and then zoom in down on Rideau & Co, transitioning into the gameplay. 
I feel that along with a bit more voiceover, this would have helped with the immediate disconnect most players likely felt upon booting up the map. The outro cutscene also has pacing issues, but not to the extent of the intro. As Drossin's rambling on, the camera zooms out to reveal that there's massive amounts of Geistcraft energy underneath Thule, which is a neat little tease that something big's coming, but the pacing of this reveal is completely fucked. Instead of giving the scene time to breathe, it, again, cuts very abruptly. It's kinda hard to explain, so I'll just let it play out. Hey! How is it that you're up to your arse in undead ghoulies and still have enough sense to translate the prehistoric scribbles of a lost race? If I had to guess, these issues likely stemmed from budgetary and time constraints as opposed to genuine creative decisions. Doesn't make the complaints any less valid though. This is something I've been having a problem with for a while, but the tone will shift. It's even more of a contrast to the earlier maps than the Shadow Throne was. The final Reich and the Darkest Shore were focused on building up an atmosphere of dread and terror, whereas the Shadowed Throne and the Tortured Path are... Well, the best comparative I can draw is the Indiana Jones films. Those films are classic adventure films with occasionally scary or fantastical elements that a full-fledged horror movie. Now, I love the Indiana Jones films. Well, two of them. So why is this a problem? Well, it all comes down to execution and a bigger picture. While the tone of each individual map is very well executed, the transition of tone between the maps and how it all fits together was very sudden and poorly handled in my opinion. If it was more of a gradual change, I wouldn't have too much of an issue with it. But as it stands, it feels like a game mode tonally at odds with itself. A similar comparative I could draw is the sudden shift in the Aether storyline when Jason Blundell officially took over, but nowhere near as extreme. For context, if you haven't really played Treyarch Zombies since, like, Black Ops 1, the Zelensky era maps had some dark background elements, but were largely cheesy, fun little zombies adventures, whereas the Origin Saga is a much darker, significantly more depressing take on the zombies lore, where themes of regret, facing your mortality, coming to grips with living a lie, loss of loved ones, and the fear of death take center stage. You know, when you put it like that, the Blundell era is a wee bit unpleasant. And that's precisely why I dig it so much. This isn't a debate on which era is better by the way. I know there's fans of both, and they both have their merits. Now back to World War II. Peter Straub's absence is felt. I know that it's certainly better for the tone of the story for him to stay dead, but with the exception of an apparition in Chapter 2, he makes no appearance, which would be fine on its own, but nothing compelling takes his place. There's no actual villain in this chapter of the saga, just zombies and the Germans, which aren't nearly as interesting as Straub and Richter were. Aside from the couple of issues I had with the tone and story, I have some issues with the things that actually matter to the internet. Gameplay. While I've praised the gameplay of the tortured path thus far, I'd be lying if I said it was perfect. Let's get into it. Defense slash escort rounds and solo. I hate everything about these. Because of how strong and frequent the zombies are, it's nearly impossible to defend your objective normally. So unless you have full jacks and or frontline, you may as well just restart. Special enemy spawn rates in chapter two are a bit much for how CQC the corridors are, especially with how broken bombers are. Let's get a bit technical for a minute here. The way a bomber's proximity fuse works is that if it's close enough to a player, it starts a timer until detonation and will explode as long as the player stays close enough. Sounds all fine and dandy, right? Well, there's a problem with this. The way it's programmed at the moment, their fuse can be set through geometry and while they're spawning in. And since their spawn in and traversal animations don't have a warning note track like the sprint animation does, that timer can be set and you would have no idea since the sound doesn't play. So if you've ever had a bomber just instantly explode as it traverses a barrier or spawns in and across the depths, or any map really, now you know why. This is a massive problem that needs to be fixed. Speaking of bombers, they no longer die when their payload detonates. Like, why? Throwing knives and ripsaw charges no longer one-hit kill bombers past a certain point. Again, what is the point of this? It feels like a way to artificially inflate the game's difficulty. Aha, you're used to certain mechanics working a certain way, but they no longer work that way, so that equals... difficulty? Yeah, let's go with that. For Chapter 1's Easter Egg, you need to build a zombie. Oh no, not again. I wanted to save this for last since it's the one I feel the most strong about but the way the map quests and survival unlocks were handled. People occasionally say that I give World War II far too much of a pass. That's 
Understandable. If you really like something, you're a lot more likely to let the smaller things off the hook because of how much you enjoy the product overall. Back to what we were talking about. The idea of a cross-map quest journey is awesome, but it all comes down to execution, and the execution this time is not good. The quests on their own are rather banal and simple due to each map being limited to 10 rounds of gameplay, but to fully complete the quest and get the cutscene, you need to do all three quests in a single sitting, and if you fail any of them for any reason, you're back to square one. Like, who is this for? Honestly. Casual players, and by that I mean the ones that just play the game and don't really care about the easter egg quests, kinda like me, those people are never going to do this. Which means that they would have never unlocked the survival maps normally. Which means, if they didn't like the new twist on the mode and just wanted to play classic zombies, there was literally nothing for them in this DLC. Now that we're through the things I didn't like, it's time for my favorite part the smaller things and nitpicks. Oh man, if there's one thing I love in this world, it's being a nitpicky goof and pointing out things that literally nobody but me cares about. When the Stadiaker spawns in, he'll temporarily eye pose and then swing down from an invisible beam. I know this is because he's reusing his intro animation from the Shadowed Throne, but it's still super distracting. The Ripsaw is missing sounds again, but this time it's not the execution sounds, it's the charging sound. And this error also allows the player to charge forever. Right. Yet again, no new bat variants. When the Stadjäger dies, his death animation counts against the in-game timer, which makes getting the challenge for beating him in under 30 seconds much more difficult than it should be. When opening a zombie's consumable crate, the cards can be seen floating in the bottom of the crate. This doesn't happen with any other type of supply drop. Seriously, we get even more variants of these idiots, but not the bats? When Straub walks away laughing in the apparition, his cloth physics aren't active and his leg clips directly through his lab coat. This is the only animation of his in the entire game where this happens. You must have a new now built into its chassis. It's like a bloody power plant. Oh really? Well, then why is the model completely unchanged? The filament material on the Meister Moishla's Elektrischnells don't have a color specified. All Moishlas use their censored Japanese materials where the gore is blacked out. This happens on the darkest shore as well, and I have no idea why. Emissive materials don't apply properly to the AVS-36. When loading into a co-op game of Beneath the Ice, all player models use a placeholder until the game loads properly. Whether or not that's just because I'm on a standard PS4, who knows. This one is more of a universal issue that I've never mentioned before, but since I know some of the people with Sledgehammer watch these, I figured I'd bring it up, and who knows, maybe like Olivia Scarf, it'll get changed someday. Vivian's head uses the wrong eye material. In Zombies, Vivian uses the standard brown eye material, whereas in the campaign, her eye is a more accurate hazel. Wow, Rizzo, how'd you notice that? I... I cheated and looked at the material names on the model exports. Now usually, we'd be done by now, but this DLC has even more content than usual, and that content comes in the form of survival maps. Let's talk about them real quick. There's three separate survival experiences, Bodega Cervantes, USS Mount Olympus, and Altar of Blood. Unlike Grossenhaus to Prologue, these maps actually have quite a few changes when compared to their Tortured Path counterparts. For example, Richter's Waffen boxes have been replaced with standard wall buys and all Wonder Weapons, barring the Wonder Bus, are available directly from the Mystery Box. A Brenner will also show up every 10 waves on Bodega and Altar. RP. But the most surprising change of all, Whistlings are completely absent from Mount Olympus. I gotta say, this is arguably the best decision that could have possibly been made, as the map's design is far too close quarters to properly accommodate them. I know how much you love the Whistling Sledgehammer, but if they were on the survival variant of this map, I and many others would probably not be happy, to put it lightly. Let's start with what I liked about the survival maps, and then we'll move on to what I didn't care for. Each of the survival maps offers a very different style of play. Bodega Cervantes is a much more open and easy to relax in map. Mount Olympus is extremely close quarters and keeps you constantly on your toes. And Altar of Blood provides a nice mix of the two. Each map's box rotation also features the Tesla gun, ripsaw, ice pick, baseball bat, and the trench knife. And after a small easter egg, all of them can be upgraded. You remember how much I said I love the melee weapons of the Shadow Throne? So you can imagine that this immediately elevated all these maps a bit in my book. Even more fun to use than the melee weapons is the upgraded Tesla gun. 
the ACAC. Kind of a boring name, but whatever. This thing is a blast. Rapid fire electric blasts that deal no damage to the player? Yeah, I can dig it. But the fun doesn't end it there, guys. Oh no, no, no. No fucking way, bros. You can also use the Sword of Barbarossa on Altar of Blood, and it's just as overpowered and awesome as you would hope. You can unleash a buffed version of the architect that the blade had in the Shadow Throne, insta-kill zombies with a standard slash, temporarily paralyze any enemy, barring the Brenner. You can trade your Geistchild slots to create a revive point, get a piece of Geistchild back with a kill similar to the Dancer's Dagger, and hilariously enough, you can actually launch bombers. <laughs> I love this game. I do have a few issues with the maps though, and no, I'm not gonna talk about the unlock method again. I think we've all beat that dead horse into the ground. First off, the way you unlock the battery for the Uber sprang it in Bodega Cervantes. What? All you have to do is play duck hunt while a teammate holds a zombie. Well, that's all fine and dandy. In, in theory. theory. But what about the solo players? Well, that's where the problem lies. Unless you're willing to waste a shell shock or a lot of jacks, you may as well just give up trying because the round transitions give you next to no time to breathe on these maps. I had this problem with certain parts of the Darkest Shore, the Shattered Throne, and now the Tortured Path. So please, Sledgehammer, if I could only ask for one thing in the next DLC, it'd be to stop punishing solo players. Oh, and add some bat variant. The bomber issue we talked about earlier transitions over to USS Mount Olympus. I have lost so much armor because of how unpredictable bombers are. Okay, this one isn't a problem I myself have, but why can't we play these maps in a public game? I mean, you could play Groston House, why can't you play these ones? I'm personally not even a public match kind of guy. Frankly, I'd rather eat glass. Why are we required to wait until a specific round to pack a punch certain weapons? No, seriously, literally what purpose does this serve? It just feels needlessly restricting. We're also, for the survival maps, reducing, removing the wave count restrictions for wonder weapons, so, uh, Rizzo, we, 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 uh, we got you, buddy. Uh, oh. Well then. Uh, never mind. This last one isn't really a problem, per se. I personally would have liked seeing some different boss zombies make an appearance. Maybe instead of a Brenner every ten rounds, the game picked from a pool of enemies. Like one round, you could get the normal Brenner, but what if you could get a Meistermoishla instead, or a pack of Sizzler spawned in? Just something to help spice up the game a bit, you know? So, despite them being kind of bare bones, what did I think of the survival maps? Honestly, despite the few issues I have, I love all of them. I honestly didn't think I would, but the fact that each map caters to a different style of play really, really bolsters the DLC. Bodega Cervantes is a lot of fun to just hop in and play for a few minutes. USS Mount Olympus is a lot of fun if you're in for a challenge. An Altar of Blood, like I said, is a nice little mix-up of the two. But let's not beat around the bush. The real attraction of Altar of Blood is being able to use the Sword of Barbarossa without being tied to the 11 round gameplay of the Tortured Path. So overall, despite a couple design decisions I don't fully agree with, the Tortured Path is something I thoroughly enjoyed. Oh, fuck. I'm such a fucking shill. It took a chance and finally shook up the zombies gameplay for the first time since Blundell took the reins back in 2013, yet still has something there for the players who maybe don't enjoy the more objective-oriented stuff. But again, the fact that these survival maps were initially locked behind easter egg completion, which was in itself thought to be locked behind a four-player public playlist because of poor communication, is genuinely one of the most easily avoidable mistakes I've ever seen in zombies. In addition to the gameplay, I really enjoyed the character and world building of this DLC. Our bureau operatives finally got a chance to shine, and surprisingly, I kinda like Jefferson now. Before this DLC, he was consistently the weak link of the group, both in writing and portrayal. But Beneath the Ice gives us a little bit more insight into who he really is, what made him the way he was, and the playful banter he shares with Drossen is a nice little cherry on top. He's not a top-tier zombies character that rivals Primus Richtofen or anything, or Poindexter, but he certainly improved from the previous entries. But with all that said, the Tortured Path is, without a doubt, a very divisive experience that will push certain players away. Just one of the many things this map has in common with Extinction. Well, that's all for today. If you enjoyed and would like to see more, you can check the description to find a playlist of all my previous long-form reviews. Anyway, thanks for watching, and have a great day.
After the release of The Tortured Path, the player base was left divided. Some lauded it for its new take on zombies, whereas others lambasted it for the exact same reason. But now we're back to normal old zombies, where rounds progress normally and you can go as long as you want. But before we really dig into the Frozen Dawn, let's recap what happened in the downtime since the release of The Tortured Path. And as always, if you'd like to skip this part and go directly to what I thought of the map itself, simply go to the timestamp on screen. Now with that out of the way, let's recap. First, and this will be a big one for a lot of players, whistling spawn rates were adjusted across the board, but the most notable change was made to solo play. No matter what round you're on, a maximum of four can spawn per round, and only two can be on the field at once. This is great for mid to high round players, because previously, high rounds on this game were incredibly frustrating. You'd have your loadout all ready to go, and then there'd be 48 whistlings that take little damage from said loadout. The Tortured Path has been slightly rebalanced. Certain objective waves appear to have been slightly retooled for solo play, but even I'll admit, it's very hard to actually confirm that. But what I can confirm is that the damage multiplier is now fully active regardless of whether you're playing in the public playlist or a solo custom match. This makes the game play a lot better and actually allows for a bit of a varied loadout. It just got boring using the 9mm after a while, you know? New orders and contracts were added. Even if some of these new orders are completely silly, I still appreciate the effort to spice things up. Seriously, survive three ways while crouched? Like, why? A new easter egg where you could temporarily use water damage Tesla guns on the darkest shore was added, and then removed when days of summer ended. Again, why? On the topic of it, a few more things came with the days of summer event. Drowned zombies that would drop fish, and Storm Raven variants of the Hunter, Survivalist, Slayer, and Mountaineer were added as special orders the player could pick up for a limited time. Do I even need to say it? Six new weapons were added to the box's global rotation. The Ribby Roll SMG, which has actually proved to be very popular because of its upgraded form. The Mosin Nagant, known in-game as the Three-Line Rifle, the Automaton, AS-44, Proto X1, and the VMG-1927 which occasionally fires explosive rounds and sets zombies on fire. Another cool thing it can do is overload and crash your game quite easily. So, don't use this one until that's fixed. While the new weapons are certainly appreciated, it's kinda gotten to the point where the box is so oversaturated with goodies that it's hard to get what you want without spending thousands upon thousands of jolts. Speaking of weapons, the LMGs have been given new special buffs when upgraded. For example, on an empty reload with the MG-15, a protective shield will appear around you and stun all enemies that enter. Kinda like the Pamela Barbarossa or the Engineer's Stasis field from Extinction. New consumables have been added with the Covert Strike community event. The one that will likely pique players' interest the most are the full armor drops and the Delisle guarantee. Personally, I was never into the weapon, but I know that the community really loves this one. And last but not least, shovel weapon kits were finally added. Now you can use those pretty variants in zombies and apply your own custom paint jobs. That's... that's great. And that's all for what's been added so far. But we're still waiting on the variant perk rework and Master Prestige rewards. The latter has been hinted at on a few occasions, but we've yet to hear any specifics about them. I can't imagine it'll be all that much longer. Well, we're all caught up, so I'd say it's finally time to gaze upon the Frozen Dawn. Yeah, I'm happy with that one. Like always, I'd like to start out with what I enjoyed about this map, because if I did it the other way around, it'd probably feel like I'm scrambling to find things I like to soften the blow of the bad, and so I don't come off as a hater. Is that a bit silly? Yeah, probably. Starting off with most of the map's story and lore. The story begins mere moments after the events of the Tortured Path, which, side note, is something I really miss from media. Like, remember how Halloween 2 began literally seconds after the events of the first one? Those were the days, I say as someone who wasn't even born into the mid-90s. After escaping Thule, Mikhail's plane is quickly shot down by the Geistcraft energy seen in the outro to Beneath the Ice. 
Meanwhile, Rideau and Vivian gaze upon a desperate fight and discuss battle plans, with Rideau insisting that the sword is their only hope for turning the tides. Vivian, being a rational human being, says, Okay, that's stupid. You've completely lost your mind, old man. Later, our four heroes awaken, cut off from Mikhail and the Bureau, so they descend even deeper into Thule for answers. As they descend, Klaus Fischer, who made a very brief appearance in the Tortured Path, returns as the new Rook, a helping hand chosen to bestow the power of the Ravens onto new Raven Lords and, in turn, bring balance to life and death itself. There's a lot more that I missed, like the history of the Thulians, the revelation of Nerthus actually being a Rook, but if you'd like to learn more about it, Reed made a really solid video detailing the story of the map. And just like last time, there'll be a link to that down in the description. As for Thule itself, the architecture and general environment is fantastically done. A common complaint of World War II zombies is how similar the map's environments and color palettes have felt to one another. It's been confirmed that this was an intentional artistic decision to keep everything feeling connected and grounded to the time period. But even I'll admit, it's nice to see them pull back the curtains and go all out. I particularly like how even though it's the same city as Beneath the Ice, it manages to distinguish itself from that map. Another fairly strong element is the map layout. This is something I feel Sledgehammer has consistently nailed throughout the entire season, even when some other elements faltered. It's again a relatively small map with a lot of twists and turns and close quarters areas, but per the norm it flows well, there's numerous ways to get around, especially if you have the flail, and the spawn points are smartly placed so you don't get overwhelmed too quickly. But my favorite thing about the map's general design is the surprising lack of invisible walls. Like in Die Rise, you can actually fall off the map if you're not careful. I personally really love this, as I feel like it really helps with the immersion. Plus, it's funny when your teammate just isn't paying all that much attention. Once again, the Pack-a-Punch unlock method is quite simple. Simply press a button and take three transports. Wait, where have I heard that before? The Dark Room. How could I not mention this? This room is super unsettling, and the low draw distance flashlight only enhances that feel. It just sucks that you can't come back to it later. The Raven Weapons Like the best zombies maps, and Origins, the Frozen Dawn features four very distinct wonder weapons so that every player in your party can have one. But unlike some of these previous maps, there isn't one single weapon that completely dominates the others. Previously, it was the Ice Staff in Origins, the Lightning Bow in Der Eisendrak, and the Acid Rain in Raven the Redwoods. For instance, the Thulian Shield may not be the best weapon for offense, but it can completely block any form of attack if held out. Even a Whistling Charge, which kind of surprised me. The Scythe, on the other hand, has fantastic offensive capabilities, but unlike the Hammer's Seeking Attack, requires you to get relatively close to make the most out of it. But honestly, the Flail, with its focus on defense, is probably my favorite of the bunch. Or maybe the Scythe. Or the Shield. Or maybe the Hammer. What I'm trying to say is I really like all these weapons. But admittedly, some of the upgrade steps are a bit silly. And some are downright infuriating. Now that we're through the gameplay elements, I want to talk about the characters. What? Rizzo wanting to discuss characters? This is the biggest surprise since Jesus rose from the dead. After five maps featuring them, we finally get to learn a bit more about Olivia, and like the stuff with Jefferson last time, it really works. But even better than that is the relationship between Marie and Olivia. Since the Shadowed Throne, I got this vibe from these two that they shared a strong bond with one another. Get your mind out of the gutter, Sal. Well, turns out I was right, and the Frozen Dawn really expands on it. So much so that after a while, Jefferson and Drossen kind of get the shaft. Now, I would admit, some of this dialogue does violate the show don't tell rule, but I can largely forgive it because of how well it works in the end. While we're talking about characters, let's talk about Vivian Harris and her role in the story. I know I said I'd leave the story stuff to read, but this is something I really want to cover, so. In your face. Ever since my first playthrough of World War II's campaign, I thought, hey, I kind of like that English chick that showed up for 16 seconds. Shame we'll never see her again. So of course, when she made a canonical appearance in DLC 3, I thought that was pretty damn neat. But back on track. Initially, her role in this map was something I hated. I felt her corruption was really convenient, had no proper buildup, and was just an excuse to get the God King back into the plot. And honestly, I couldn't exactly blame others for thinking that. Throughout the map, she makes two appearances, once after round four to talk about the sword, then at the very end of the quest where she suddenly turncoat and resurrects the God King. Oh, well, all of you stupid idiots 
thought I was dead. Everybody thought Grandpa died. Let me do. He's back. He always comes back, and he always gets what he fucking wants. It's initially very jarring, but then I took a look at her notebook entries and they actually round out that plot point into probably my favorite story element of the entire map. Initially, she takes the sword from Mikhail to save Jefferson and his team after Rideau tells her to abandon them. At first, things go quite well, but as her journey continues, something begins to influence her dreams with visions of a serene, beautiful kingdom covered with lilies and protea blooms, convincing her that these visions are what could have been were it not for the Rook and his ravens. At that point, it has its hooks in her and guides her directly to Thule, where she's ultimately manipulated into resurrecting the God King and immediately killed. On the topic of Vivian's death, I really like the execution of it. Pun completely intended, by the way. It's not heroic or drawn out with emotionally manipulative music. It's sudden, brutal, and worst of all, she dies a traitor. With all this story focus on her, Vivian has easily become one of my favorites. Although Peter Straub is still admittedly my favorite of the season. Udo Kier's portrayal of the character is just wonderfully creepy. And finally, our four heroes becoming the new Raven Lords. Something about this just feels right. Now with the real good stuff covered, it's time to list off the little things that, on their own, don't really matter all that much, but together, help make the experience just a wee bit better. Marie's model was given an Electro Chanel holder globally. This means that her winter and default uniform now has this. Four new special characters were added for the really dedicated players, including a zombie? Okay. When zombies rise out of blood pools, they have a grit layer of blood on their bodies. The ability to choose different starting weapons and play as a zombie after completing all the quests. Admittedly, it's nowhere near as satisfying as Infinite Warfare's Director's Cut mode, but it's a nice little bonus for those who went the extra mile. After the boss intro, our characters have Geistcraft wings for the rest of the game. A bit on the nose? Yup. Kinda neat looking? Also yup. So with all the good stuff, both big and small covered, it's time to get into the things I didn't really care for. Without further ado, let's get into the bad. Let's start with one of the selling points of the map, the newly awakened Thulians, otherwise known as Corpse Eaters. From a lore perspective, I really like them, but in gameplay, they're kinda underwhelming. I thought that they would be something challenging that'd spice up the gameplay a bit like the Moishlas or Sizzlers, but in normal play, they don't show up all that often, and when they do, honestly, I'd say a bomber is more intimidating. Another gameplay element that I feel falls flat is this map's over-reliance on soul boxes. I get that they're used in a thematic and lore-driven way to show the voracious appetite of Thule, but there comes a point where even I have to put aside the lore and say, okay, this is a bit repetitive. The main quest. While it's not annoying like the tortured path or mind-numbingly stupid like Revelations, it occupies a space I feel is much worse, and that space is one of banality. Here's the entire quest, obtain and upgrade the Thulean weapons, fight the God King, and that's it. It kind of feels like an afterthought and that all the effort went into the fight itself, which is admittedly a pretty damn good fight. It's just a shame that the rest of the quest can't live up to it. The seeming lack of time or budget really rears its ugly head here, especially in regards to QA, because in my experience, there are a lot of bugs in this map. I've been indefinitely stuck in the Pack-a-Punch area, I've been stuck twiddling my thumbs in the dark room forever, the map has crashed on me six times, once because I had the audacity to pick up an MG42, and the worst one, the flamethrower exploit. This one was fixed pretty damn quickly, but before that, you could just bring in a flamethrower and kill the God King in less than a minute. The outro cutscene also feels like a chopped up mess. I'm gonna put on my conspiracy theory hat for a second, but I refuse to believe that it was a conscious decision to have literally nothing between Marie and Klaus besides a simple look. Marie's desire to save and reconcile with Klaus was literally the thing that set this entire story into motion. Honestly, it feels like they're under a time crunch and just had to get the primary story beats done in about 20 seconds. Like, there's not even a... Hey, yo, sis. What's up, B? Speaking of a lack of resolution, there is absolutely no resolution to the world's fight against the undead. Rideau simply says... The world and it ends there, and we're just left to speculate. I cannot tell you how disappointed I am by this. 
Most other elements in this map's story are great, we've talked about them, but this really damages the map for me. It feels like the story just cuts off midway through the finale and says, you figure it out. Maybe it was my fault for going in with the expectation of, this will be the map to bring everything together and close this story out completely. I think Pizzeria Simulator spoiled me. That game is my personal gold standard for closing out a story. Now, I understand that the Frozen Dawn might not have been meant to do what Pizzeria Simulator did, and was merely supposed to wrap up this season while leaving the door open for sequels, but it doesn't even do that. So much is left unresolved. And this is my biggest problem with the Frozen Dawn, a lack of resolution. All the pieces were there to provide a fantastic wrap up, but like I said with Revelations, in the end, those pieces just don't cohere into something all that satisfying. We do admittedly get character conclusions for Vivian, Rideau, and the Raven team members. But that's it. There's still a ton of questions left up in the air. What about the undead hordes? What about Drossen's wife and newborn daughter? How about Marie and Klaus? Did they finally reconcile? Lord knows they didn't really have a chance to in Middleburg. Did Klaus even have control over his actions? Also, what happens to Klaus after the cutscene? Does he just go away because his purpose in the plot is finished? Now I'm not saying it's anywhere near as offensive as some of the other finales, especially Revelations, but I still can't help but be disappointed regardless. So we're through what I didn't like. Let's move on to something a bit more fun, the nitpicks that literally nobody but me cares about. When landing a fatal blow on a corpse eater with a shovel, you'll hit it in the upper chest, but its head will still fly off. This is because it's using an animation meant for standard zombies, which are much shorter than corpse eaters. The camera movement on the Thulean Hammer's attack animation sharply resets halfway through, and as a result, every swing looks awkward and unnatural. The mild discrepancies between Vivian's in-game and CGI model. Her hair is parted differently, the clavicle straps lack those gold bits, and oddly, her scarf is a completely different color than the in-game one. Also, she applied a bright red layer of lipstick, but didn't wash the dirt off her face? Okay, that one's a bit ridiculous. Even for me. Why didn't Rideau just tell us his plan from the beginning? Or at least tell Vivian. She is his top agent after all. Or at least, how about you tell her, hey, don't touch the sword. It'll get you killed and it'll ruin everything. I know because I'm a member of the Raven Order, so maybe trust me and don't try to play hero. Okay? Cool. If he did that instead of being vague with his wording, the resurrection of the Burger King, and subsequently, Vivian's death could have been avoided, and everything would have been fine. This actually reminds me of something, but I can't quite put my finger on it. What was it? Oh, right! When Vivian dies, I'm fairly certain she has no face posing. This is admittedly a lot less egregious than Straub's death in the Shadow Throne, but it's still distracting once you know it's there. The God King's tassels clip through his cloak when he gets up. I don't have access to the model yet, but I bet anything that it's because they're dynamic joints. These tend to clip much more often. The most obvious examples of this are the chains on the bomber, the panzer mortar, and Pearson's dog tags. The unlockable zombie is using the censored Japanese textures with blacked out gore. This happens on all versions of the game, regardless of region. A similar thing happens with Moishlas and Meister Moishlas on all maps. Why was this done? I have no idea. I think Vivian is still using the wrong eye material. After a recent update, ZMP variants of the Mountaineer, that's the Moonraven and Stormraven outfits, use the female body. Sabarov's head with a female body is genuinely the most unsettling image this game has ever produced. Is the Bat variant joke overplayed yet? Yep. But I've gone too far to back down now. If the Thulean tubes rip you apart and then reassemble you, how come our characters aren't screaming in agony the entire time? And lastly, the Blade of Barbarossa's material has been globally updated. Not in a good way though. It looks like a complete disaster now. Like, I can't fathom why they change it from this cool piece of metal infused with an ancient energy to a glow stick capable of blinding everyone that's ever been born. So overall, I feel like the Frozen Dawn is a solid map that stumbles in a few key areas. Honestly, this is the map I feel the most conflicted about in the entire season. Like I said, there's some elements in here I absolutely love, like the lore, the map's visual style and presentation, the relationship between Marie and Olivia, and the character of Vivian Harris, but at the same time, there's some elements that hold it back from being the great finale I was hoping for. 
Most of these issues, be it the very abrupt, inconclusive ending, short outro cutscene, and general lack of bug testing, probably could have been solved with another couple weeks of time. But we're not here to review what could have happened, we're here to talk about what shipped. And what we got is, I feel, a solid, if ultimately undercooked offering. It reminds me of the feeling I, and many others got from Transit, The Beast from Beyond, and The Darkest Shore. A feeling like... something just wasn't right. And with that, we've come to the end of World War II Zombies. Honestly, despite a few bumpy parts, I really love this game's take on zombies. Which, as I've said before, was genuinely surprising. If you remember my original review of the game from back in December, well, I'll just play the clip. I was 100% convinced that no non-Treyarch studio could do zombies properly, and that this game was going to be terrible. It plays well, especially after the whistling tuning update, has some solid characters, and features a lot of little innovations that I never knew I wanted, like the mods and specials. But easily my favorite thing, I absolutely love the richness of the game's lore and world, even if I didn't always agree with the direction it took. I love how it started off by connecting itself to real world events and played with ancient legends and the darker, unknown parts of history. However, there were some aforementioned bumpy parts that I feel could be improved on or tweaked in whatever project Sledgehammer decides to tackle next. And some things that I just want to rant about. Easily my biggest personal gripe with the season was the tonal shift. Horror is my bread and butter, so when the season shifted, quite suddenly too, into an epic adventure with some horror elements thrown in, I was naturally quite disappointed. The base game had something special, with its unique blend of horror and action. But after The Darkest Shore, that completely changed. If the story continues in this Indiana Jones-esque direction in the future, I just hope they commit to it from the beginning, instead of bait and switching us midway through the season. The lack of dialogue unless you're playing with a full team. It actually took me quite a while to get all the character development for Raven Team, because I just didn't get a full team together. I think a system such as the one Black Ops 3 had would be a much better system to adopt. Whether you were playing solo in that game, or just with one other player, there was still dialogue there. Let's say you were playing a game of Revelations with a buddy. One player is Richtofen, one player is Takio. There was still dialogue and conversations that would play. But if you played with all four players, the same dialogue and conversations would play out, and there'd be even more added onto it with other characters chiming in. This kind of leads me into another problem I had. For as much as I praised the gameplay, and I believe there really is a lot to praise here, there were some decisions that were clearly not balanced for Solo. The biggest offenders were the escorts in the Darkest Shore, the safe in the Shadowed Throne, and the entirety of Beneath the Ice's main quest. I understand that the game is meant to be played with a full team, but I feel that the game should also be playable solo, with team play enhancing the experience, not filling the gap of poor balance. While the performances of Darren DePaul, David Tennant, Helen Sadler, and Udo Kier are top-notch, the rest are rather inconsistent, especially Catherine Winnick as Marie. Some of her deliveries are quite good, but some just fall right on their face. The consumable system was... really bad. Like I said back in December, it feels like a last minute addition that was simply added because, well, microtransactions make money. Thankfully, it did not impede on the gameplay or provide wildly unfair buffs like Black Ops 3 or IW. And lastly, the most important thing that I feel could be added in the sequel, besides some solo play adjustments, is a library or codex of some sort where the player could view a ton of lore information in-game instead of needing to stalk Dayton and Warnkey on Twitter. For example, did you know that Drossen had a wife and newborn child? Or that the Necromedic is canonically the smuggler from the Shadow Throne? Maybe some of you did, but I guarantee most casual players miss these because they're simply not in the game. Personally, I don't mind this all that much, as when I like something, I latch onto it and try to absorb as much information as humanly possible. Yes, I do have a problem, but like with Marie's journal or the zombie's timeline, I completely understand why people don't care for this kind of stuff. I feel something like an in-game library would help expand the audience and keep story interest going throughout the season. And, frankly, it'd be a lot more accessible to newcomers. Well, that's all for World War II Zombies. And what an interesting season it was. If you enjoyed and would like to see more, there's a link down in the description with all my other long-form reviews. Whether it's Black Ops 3, Infinite Warfare Zombies, or even Extinction, I've got you covered. 
And with that, I'd like to take a second to discuss the future of the channel. I know I already did an update video a while back, but just in case some people miss that, you know? I'll likely be taking another break after my upcoming World War II Zombies music video. Now I know I just got back a couple months ago, but I'm not going to be doing nothing during this break. I'm planning on focusing most of my creative efforts into The Road Reviewed. For those unfamiliar, this is a massive review of Black Ops 1, 2, and 3 Zombies modes, Infinite Warfare Zombies, and Extinction. As for Black Ops 4, it's honestly not something that's really piqued my interest so far. And I honestly don't want to force out content if it's something I'm not passionate about. Because I'm pretty sure you guys have noticed, when a YouTuber isn't into a movie or a game they're talking about, you can tell. That being said, I'm more than open to making a review on the game Zombies if it ends up exceeding my expectations like World War II did. Only time will tell, I suppose. Anyway, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and have a great day.